Well, hopefully that means that we're now live. We shall soon find out. Um, I'll just give it a little bit of time to see if there's anybody that's managed to stay with us. And um, ah, you know, I can see a live stream coming on there. No, nope. no, still nothing. It is showing me as live here, and it's showing stream status as good. And I can see what we're. I can see on the preview on on YouTube that it's all going. So that's the extent of my um, my boomer technology. I think we can safely now say that Vox Pop's first live stream was a resounding 0 out of 10. My apologies to those of you that attended and were frustrated by the boomer tech that I exhibited. Thankfully, we've now got that sorted. But in the meantime, here, without further ado, is a recording with the illustrious uh, Mr. Simon Roberts. So um, let's go over now to that recording and I hope you enjoy it. Simon, apologies for that. Uh, welcome and good evening. Thank you very much for having me. Well, well, um, thank you for uh, thank you for being my my um, my guinea pig, I suppose, on this first um, quite odd. I'm seeing a live chat going on in front of me. You probably are as well, but um, we're mm. not actually being watched. It would seem so, unless they happen to find us. Um, I think first of all, it's worth just. I wanted to find out a bit about you, Simon. Um, where I'm trying to go with Vox Pop, I think, is to is to make it a bit more personal um i don't i listen to your streams both listen to the gust stream previously with hector and then also to the difficult second album which is splendid um and i listened also yesterday to the difficult second album i think episode three was it or episode four mm. with um with uh, james Bembridge, which i also thought was very good um and uh, enjoyable to listen to um but you are far too um erudite and um and um, well informed really for for me to be able to compete even so i think uh, i'm better going for the um uh, a, a lower brow version let's put it that way <laughs> um i always try to aspire for low brow and i normally succeed so um and i wanted to find out a little bit about you because you're always talking mm. to other people and um you're always exploring ideas mm. I first came across you, I think, probably probably about twelve months ago, wasn't it? Um, I think you were that moderating long. on a on a Dellingpod. Uh, yeah, a remember. Dellingpod stream with yes. um, Dick, live with Dick and James. Yes, yes, I do the moderating for them. You did, and you did a splendid job. And I was probably, ironically, I was probably commenting on technical issues. Um, yeah, that's right. I remember now. You, you DM'd me and uh, and filled me in on things we could do, be doing better, which was uh, nearly everything, which I thought was a fair comment at that point. I, was actually. I that critical? I hope not. Oh, perhaps I was. No, um, no, not really. You were really nice about it. But <laughs> I think what I was, I, I was already following um, James Paul's podcast and I'd already yeah. seen, I think, probably two or three um, of the brothers talking, I think, at that point. I'm not sure. Yeah. And they were very enjoyable, but I know what it was. I was saying was that it was that um, this is an aside, but it um, it was things like they are they're very random. They go they, they they were basically reading through the they were reading through the comments, and then they were they were all over the place. And their usual excellent conversation was somewhat distracted by the comments. And I think because obviously I knew everything about live streaming at that point, as is evidenced by uh, this <laughs> evening, I think I'd thrown into the comments that um, they'd do better to have the conversation and then perhaps. Uh, perhaps you moderate and throw in relevant comments, but um, mm. it's so much easier to tell people what's wrong than it is to actually do it yourself. As um... <laughs> it, it is an art streaming, isn't it? I mean, you know, when you watch some of the more experienced people on YouTube, the the sort of the sargons of the world, or the, or, or, or you know the the uh, the academic agents, people like that, or people who just do sort of you know um, curated presented videos like Paul Joseph Watson, or you know any any of a number of, of different YouTubers. Um, the art of, of putting material together on YouTube is quite tricky and live streaming is actually um, reasonably tricky, even if you try to keep it simple, not just because of technical problems, but because of the various information feeds like the chat going in and listening to you know the, the people you're speaking with and the private comments between you on the stream that, that are out of sight and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's, you know keeping a few plates spinning at once it's um it's something where it'd be nice to have a kind of you know joe rogan setup i think you said before you know where you have a producer and all you have to do is just open the mic and just go yada 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 um but um yeah doing it yourself with uh, with uh, with no funding is a uh, can be a bit of a challenge but um hmm. you know it's it's a great it's a great thing to have you know hours and hours and hours 
as I tend to use up <laughs> of free <laughs> YouTube time. Um, I kind of I kind of marvel that they don't actually charge for it. Really, I'm just thinking this is surely coming because you know there's there's there's, there's idiots like me doing streams for seven and a half hours, and I don't know how. You know, using up however much space, probably minimal and infinitesimally small in all of the service space they have. But nonetheless, it's um, it's amazing to have that much sort of latitude to just go on and kind of broadcast if if you can get the audience to broadcast. Where I'm more of a narrow caster at the moment, obviously. <laughs> well, yes, I'm yes, I'm even more so of a narrow caster. Um, mm. I, I know. I think. I mean, the Joe Rogan thing. I got into Joe Rogan probably a couple of two or three years ago. And mm. um, because of what I do, I sort of have a week or so at home and then go away again. So mm. I really got into the way of his conversations. And he'll have two or three hour conversations uh, with very interesting people and people you've maybe never heard of. And um, he does a great job. I like to, I want to mold myself on Joe Rogan, but without the talent or the backing or the audience. Um, yes, indeed. And I think I'm doing very well so far in that respect. Excellent. Excellent. You, um, you've replicated his style completely. <laughs> Yes, except except without the success. But um, yeah, um, yeah. I, I um, so yes, we hear a lot about people you're talking to, mm. um, and I've heard little bits, uh, snippets of mm. you. But who is Simon Roberts? Where I know you were born in the northeast mm. from yeah, memory. That's right. So would yeah, you like to tell right. us your, the early days of Simon Roberts? Oh yes, as as Charlie Sheen says in the 1987 film Wall Street, "Who am I?" Um, I was born in Hartlepool. Uh, in the northeast in county cleveland as it was then as i think it has returned to uh, after an interim of being county durham in 1971 my father was an ex merchant navy um, chief petty officer and my mother worked in various positions in the local civil service um i had a sister born in uh, about 1975 and we then moved from hartlepool when i was nine in 1981 to australia and we lived on the West Coast in Perth. And I stayed there for about 13 years. I came back to England at the end of 1994, back to London to uh, seek my fortune on the stage, which, which, uh, as it turns out, I, I signally failed to do. Um, I, I wanted to be a classical Shakespearean actor, and I came back to London and auditioned for the drama schools um, with without the important proviso of having any of the money necessary to pay the fees. <laughs> I thought this was a, a cunning trick on my part to induce sympathy and, uh, you know, possibly get some sort of, you know, local authority funding or a grant or some sort of bursary or scholarship. Um, those sorts of things, alas, um, had by that point completely evaporated, probably a couple of years before I came back. So I think, you know, probably when you, you were of the same sort of age, a few years uh, before me, you may have had like uh, local authority funding for things like that. Hmm. But um, it had all gone. So I, I sort of was doing these auditions and they were kind of going, oh, very good. Um, you know, how are you going to pay the fees? Uh, because the fees for these drama schools were like 1500 quid a term, which um, was a considerable amount back, back then. And, and, and London was a very expensive place to live anyway. And um, I would just sort of go, oh, I, I thought maybe you'd have some sort of scholarship, you know, to, to help me study at the, <laughs> the most famous drama schools in the world. And they just shook their heads and said, no, no, not really. <laughs> That's unfortunate, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's uh, bad brutal. timing. I, I, uh, when would that have been exactly that you came that back? Was, yeah, that was 1995. I settled in London um, with my then girlfriend in Cricklewood and um, was, you know, making my way through you know the day with a you know a job temping in an office uh, during the day and working in the bar in the victoria palace theater in the evening um which was at that time hosting the musical buddy uh, interesting right. um so um i sort of you know plodded along after you know going through all of these auditions and ultimately obviously realizing that i wasn't going to get anywhere because there wasn't any funding i mean again people have to remember this is pretty much pre-internet days where getting access to information was a question of you know literally writing off uh, to places for things and and given that i'd been in australia you know um you know you could you could send off a letter to britain you know and, and not receive anything back for ages um so it just seemed easy just to come to britain and try and sort of do it on the fly yeah. which which i discovered in the end didn't make any difference because getting information at that time was such that the schools themselves weren't particularly clear or helpful about you know what sort of funding was available and um 
so I struggled with that somewhat. I went and looked to see if there was any funding. There was various kind of arts funding handbooks around the place, which you could sort of look up and see whatever bursaries and scholarships and, you know, bequests and legacies and all sorts of things might be out there. And it didn't turn out that there were any available for people to go to drama school, really. Um, so that was uh, kind of the end of that. I didn't see any way I was going to earn the kind of money that I would need to to pay drama school fees at all. And uh, I sort of then decided to try and give it a go by just presenting myself into the world of theatre uh, to see if I could um, get anywhere just by sort of sheer drive and persistence. Mm. Um, so what I decided to do was I decided to, to ring the National Theatre every day for a month, um, <laughs> you know, to the staff director's office and just leave the same message on the answer phone <laughs> every day, every single day for a month. And, you know, don't, you know, just don't show any irritation that you're not, you know, they're not mm. getting back to you or anything, just politely the same message every single day and um eventually a very nice man who was the staff director called frank nealon uh gave me a call and said oh god what is it you know what do you want <laughs> and said, um and he, he said well come in you know come in and have a chat to us and i thought fantastic this is great went down to the national theater on the south bank and um sat in his office and said look um I, i'd like to do you know I, I want to be an actor but i want to be doing directing as well have you got any assistant directing work and, you know, we were sat in this office and there was three or four young people in their 20s. And uh, he said, well, you know, all of these guys here have already done, you know, several seasons up at Chichester Festival, you know, or they've done, you know, Edinburgh Fringe or they've done this and that. And I kind of was sort of floored, you know, I, I said, well, you know, there was, there was nothing like that in Australia. I couldn't. You know, there was even in the eastern states where there's a bit more theatre than in Perth. Yeah. You might have found some theatre companies to work with, but you, you didn't have anything like the range of opportunities you had in England where I guess the repertory system was, you know, kind of it, it, it probably had pretty much gone by that point. But there were certain kind of circuits for people to sort of apprentice themselves in theatre and uh, to to companies or to, you know, to to directors. And uh, I said, well, you know, there's no way I could compete with that. You know, is there anything you can give me at all? I mean, I, you know, I'll literally sweep the floor and make the tea. And he said, well, OK, we've got a play starting rehearsals next week uh, called Absolute Hell. It's a sort of uh, play by Rodney Ackland, who is a sort of relatively little known writer. It's set in the aftermath of the Second World War uh, in, a, in, a, in a sleazy bar in Soho. And uh, it's about a sort of range of kind of bohemian characters who come in and, uh, you know, have a bit of a raucous time. And I said, oh, that, sounds, that sounds great. You know, and he said, the director wants somebody to take notes. Uh, and I said, fabulous. Uh, um, lovely director called Anthony Page. Uh, he directed a BBC adaptation of Middlemarch, I think, that had been around at that time. Right. And um, and he's uh, and Frank said, yeah, uh, the play uh, the play stars Judy Dench. And I thought I thought, oh, great. This is fantastic. Come up. Trump's here. You know, I'm, I'm going straight into working in a rehearsal in a play from just walking off the street, um, assisting a director who's <laughs> working with Judy Dench. Yeah, some huge names. So <laughs> that was fantastic. But we um, so we started in rehearsal room one at the National Theatre and, uh, um, you know, I can't remember how long it was now, but I think overall I was there for about six months and uh and it was literally, it wasn't really assistant directing. It was just like literally taking notes for the director. I mean, he would sit, ne you know, I would sit next to him, you know, watching the play and he would just whisper in my ear about, you know, oh, yeah, tell Judy to do this or move over there or tell Greg to do this or, you know, come in on this line, whatever. And, and that would be literally my job. I would be his amanuensis and I would just then go off um, after each rehearsal and just literally give people the notes that he'd asked me to pass on to them, um, which, uh, and it was a fantastic um introduction to professional to see how professional theatre it, it works in i mean they they don't they don't they're no slouches in these big companies like the national and the rsc they they they, they really work um i mean what struck me was actors were coming in first day of rehearsal and stuff and they were trying to get off the book you know learn their lines and and do without the script from the first day wow. um so they 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 really worked hard and there were some some lovely people in the company uh there was uh, greg hicks there was a guy called Pip Torrens, a uh, lovely actor. He often plays Hugh Grant's brother in films, it seems, at that time. Right. Oh, yes. Um, I know that there guy. was Bet Betty Marsden, who used to be in Round the Horn. Um, um, my mother was quite excited about that. I didn't really know who she was, but she was a really, really lovely lady. Oh, that's, that's covering a few generations there, isn't it? Yeah, that's... yeah, yeah. But um, there, was, uh, there was, who else was in the cast? There was uh, uh, Bill McCabe, uh, or Richard McCabe, his real name is, but he calls him Bill, uh, lovely, lovely character actor. And um, 
and uh, yeah, it was it was a, it was a really terrific time. Um, Brian Cox's son, Alan Cox, was in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, David Horovich, lovely show, and it was a brilliant show. And of course, Judy Dench, and and got to see them working close up, and um, it was fantastic. It was it was really great. I mean, it was a kind of pretty gentle introduction to things, and it is a bit weird when you have to sort of you know give professional actors their notes after, you know. I mean, luckily they were all incredibly gracious and kind people, and and didn't take any kind of. Um, you know, umbrage at the fact that it was me, you know, telling them what to do. But it is a weird experience, you know, telling Judy Dench what 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 she, what she has to do. In, yeah. In, uh, yeah. You know. So we did that um, right up until the uh, the play opened, um, the pre, you know the previews, press nights, all of that stuff. And then there was a period where, you know, as the play's bedding in, I was still sort of, you know, sitting watching the show, you know, every night for a few, a few weeks uh, while we took more notes. And then, you know, after the previews, the play goes kind of live and and goes on from there and so i was looking to try and get something after that um and putting my name around the theater i mean essentially there was there was other plays being rehearsed at the same time different rehearsal rooms and i'd be sort of popping my head in talking to directors to see if you know they wanted anyone to do a similar sort of assisting job um and unfortunately there was kind of no one who seemed to show show any interest um there was richard Eyre who was running the national at the time and I noticed one Sunday he'd written a sort of piece in the papers about um, how young, you know, young directors uh, need to have, you know, need to they, they need to have, uh, you know, a sort of a mentor figure and older directors should take them under their wing and all this. And I thought, oh, fantastic. He's kind of <laughs> he's, he's you know, he's nailed his colours to the mask. And I, I you know, I I'd sort of, you know, obviously I'd see him around the theatre and stuff. But I did the polite thing and sort of wrote a letter and handed it in in his office. And he then he wrote back to me and effectively said no. <laughs> You bloody hypocrite you know he said you're already in touch with the staff director you know he's the guy to pursue for this work and um so i just hung about but there was nothing that came up unfortunately i mean you know once once the play's up and running the actors are all you know either split up other, uh, into various other companies if they're on a sort of a longer term contract and uh you know the gang kind of uh goes on to do other plays and um so nothing really happened from there i just sort of uh, you know sort of mooched around and I, I had my staff card so i kept kind of going in and sort of looking at the notice board seeing what was happening see if there's anyone to talk to trying to hustle a little bit but didn't didn't really get anywhere um my girlfriend was having a bit more luck at the time doing fringe theater and getting involved with various companies and i would sort of end up helping out on plays um doing doing little bits here and there and uh you know trying to sort of drift in through it through another angle into the theater world mm-hmm. um but it was um it was it was really very difficult because you really need in order to get into professional theater you need to have an agent and of course i didn't have an agent so i tried subscribing to various actors newsletters and things and you go and do auditions at little fringe theaters and i remember going to do an audition at uh, you know a little tiny theater in um well oh god where was it it was it was somewhere like near the uh, uh, uh anyway it doesn't matter shepherd's bush i think it was and it was like it was like a tiny little space about six foot by two foot in front of a bar right. you know, it was kind of long was like the amount of space a stand up less than the amount of space a stand up comedian would use and i had to sort of audition for you know a role in henry the fifth you know in this <laughs> little dark tiny bar it was really really weird and um uh and of course people treat you if you haven't gone to drama school with a certain amount of caution uh you know um and i went to various of these fringe theater auditions and i went to one at the man in the moon theater which is on the king's road um just at the end of the king's road opposite where vivian westwood's shop is um Mm. and uh they used to have a little sort of below ground theater and it was quite a reasonably well-liked theater and uh, i uh, went in there and did did uh, did an audition for something and i was chatting to a guy who was doing an audition with me and he turned out to be uh a guy he's he'd gone to drama school with daniel day lewis and uh i was saying to him about oh it's, it's really difficult you know i can't get into drama school you know but uh you know i i'd um, done a lot of university plays in, in western australia when i was there you know i'd, I'd played richard the second and i directed the play and I'd been in Love's Labour's Lost. Um, I'd been in, you know, I'd directed a production of Henry V, you know. So you've still got a CV. It's not like you're coming straight in with yeah. an ambition and nothing else. You've, you've... Yeah, I just I, I, I just did a load of plays at university in lots of different styles, not just Shakespeare. We did sort of Polish Impressionist theatre from the 20s, you know. We did Tom Stoppard, um, Brecht, all kinds of stuff. Great fun. 
And um, so I had a few things that I'd done. I had the, you know, the energy and sort of zest to, to come and do more. And, you know, I said, look, I, I can't do the training, but look, here's my ability. And and when I'd done plays in, in Western Australia, we had the guys who were the teachers and the principal at the local uh, acting academy in, in Perth. And uh, this was the West Australian Academy of Performing Arts, WAPA. And at the time, you know, I had friends who were at WAPA who were doing theatre or musical theatre. And it was the same time that Hugh Jackman was there. So I, I, I met Hugh a few times before, mm-hmm. you know, he went on to become super famous and stuff. Yeah. He was just he was just nice old Hugh at the, down at the academy. Um, and uh, so I had a few of those guys from the teachers come and see a uh, production of Richard II I did. And and afterwards, you know, had a chat with them and they were very complimentary. They were like, well, you, you, you don't want to sound big, you, you're really good. You know, and the, the, the acting teacher, uh, Nigel Ridout, who'd been, uh, I think he'd, he'd worked at Lambda in London, said, yeah, I don't think there's really anything I can teach you about Shakespeare. This is uh, you know, very solid. Uh, they said, you know, maybe you could do a little bit of movement work or something, you know, limber up a bit, mm-hmm. you know, free your, you know, your physical style. But apart from that... Um, you've got a good voice, you know, good stage presence, you know what you're doing. Uh, and I sort of got a bit of a big head from that. Um, and I, I thought, well, I'll just go to Britain and then, you know, they'll just give me roles at the Royal Shakespeare Company. You know, <laughs> I'll just walk in there like, you know, Kenneth Branagh or something. And, well, um, it happens though, doesn't it? That's the thing. Sometimes you can yeah. just, it works, you know. It how, did, how old it, were you then? I was, uh, well, I would, uh, 1995, I would have been, what, uh, 20, uh, I can't remember my own age, 23. Right. 22, 23. And, um, and yeah, you're right. I mean, that's kind of one of the things you read all the kind of actor biographies, you know, all the kinds of people from sort of Burton onwards and Olivia and stuff. And it's always got these stories where they're, they're saying things like, you know, I was I was 19 years old and just, you know, riding past a village hall one day and they were doing auditions for a play. And they said, come in an audition. And then they gave me the part. And then an agent came down from London and saw me. And then I was whisked off to the West End. Um, and of course, that shit doesn't really happen anymore <laughs> at all. So I was kind of... Um, I was at this, uh, you know, at this audition with this guy, um, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd said to him, "Well, yeah, you know, I, I, I had these guys come and see me, who were professional drama teachers, and said I didn't really need to go to drama school." You know, uh, and the guy sort of looked at me in a pained way and said, oh, Simon, you know, you don't go to drama school to learn how to act. You you go to make connections. You know, you go for the networking. You go to get an agent. Yeah. And uh, that's a mark of how naive and stupid I was. And I said, oh, yeah, okay. I think that so, works uh, with everything, doesn't it? I mean, that works with, you know, if you go to Oxford yeah. or Cambridge, something that was never explained to me when I was um, a kid, when I was doing my A-levels or O-levels and then A-levels. It, I thought, well, you know, does it really matter that much? I, I really didn't try. I'm not saying I would have got there, but, you know, I certainly mm. didn't try for it. And then it's only afterwards when you, you realise, well, of course, it's not necessarily the course you're on, but if, if yes. your peers are now in the government, for example... Yes. Um, it, you know, it means that all your other peers are in serious positions, aren't they, in whatever field yeah. they've gone into. That's yeah. it, yeah. I, yeah. I you don't, and that's never explained to you, is it? You no. know, it's like the transition from school when you've, you know, you come out of school and you've got all the energy and talent and spunk and all of that, everything. I mean, lots of people have got that. They're just it's between school and university. They're kind of a, a peak of energy and enthusiasm. And nobody kind of sits you aside and says, look, you actually need to go through a certain professional gateway in order to get where you want to go. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I confused going through the professional gateway with learning competence in the art, whereas actually people should have said, no, 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 mate. It's, it's all about the, the handshaking and the networking and all of that stuff. That's, you know, that's kind of the thing you actually need. You need to go and glad hand these people and, and you know, put yourself around and um i just thought i was under the weird impression that you know y- y- your energy and your talent and alone would be enough to sell people of course it isn't and people do need to be shown where to sort of head to actually get their kind of spurs yes i mean i think even it because the other thing is i i'm understand you know later in your career and, and you know even now when i'm doing what i'm doing whatever you do a lot of it is about who you know and not necessarily what you know you know you could obviously you have to be competent in order to get more work, but um, who you know really helps um, at any age and in any career. But when you're young, it's not like it's... Because I find it really tiresome going to lunches and... I don't mind going mm, to a lunch yeah. with friends. I, that's one of my favourite activities. But um, mm. going to a lunch with people you don't know and you perhaps don't really like is really hard work. Yeah, um, okay, and yeah. I find that very boring. But of course, when you're at university you're mixing with people you like it just happens that those people that you like or you got on with or you know on nodding terms 
mm. are suddenly in um, positions uh, yeah. that are important later in yeah. life. So yeah. yeah, yeah. And to be fair to myself, I didn't have any kind of connections over here. I'd just come, you know, on the sort of s smell of the grease paint and the roar of the crowds, mm. um, assuming that you could inveigle your way in. But, I mean, what I eventually learned, of course, was that, you know, unless you'd been to one of what we call the big four drama schools, that's either, you know, RADA or Central or Guildhall or Drama Centre, um, or you'd been to Cambridge, um, or maybe in a minor key, Oxford as well, right. um, you, you, you weren't going to get anywhere. You weren't going to sort of land on the scene because there were accepted channels and pathways that were the only ones that were being looked at for professional access to to these places so you you the the age i think of, of apprenticing yourself as i thought may be possible because lots of older actors and directors had done that had had just gone it, it was just dead um and and it was very difficult i mean i my sort of you know in persistence with the national is kind of the the kind of freak trick that got me a kind of you know um uh, a job the unpaid job <laughs> for, for six months um but um you know it wasn't going to translate into anything afterwards so i i ended up sort of uh, mooching around in fringe theater for a few years trying to do, sort of find things to do get involved with things and you end up sort of without any acting work you end up doing am amdram theater amateur theater mm -hmm. and um you can you know you can get a bit of activity out of it but it's it's kind of not leading anywhere because the professional scene doesn't really look in on any of that stuff at all yeah, uh, yeah. And, and again it's only the kind of good luck stories that you hear about but the good luck stories there's always a bit more to it you know somebody knows somebody they're doing an amateur show and then you know they're they're daddy's friend is an agent and comes and sees it and then takes them off and, and that's it so unless you do your your three years in a in a you know expensive drama school which requires independent wealth or you have come through cambridge and that way is more of a direct um, getting into the directing stream you you will struggle um and the only other way you can really make it is to sort of bang your bang your hand on the bang your fist on the doors of all the fringe theatres, try to get into shows, acting shows. And generally it takes around 10 years from coming in as a kind of untrained actor to get noticed. So the people who I met, later met at professional theatres after that had generally, yeah, had to sort of just be around the traps for about 10 years. And then eventually something would happen, you know, just by dint of the time it had taken and, you know, the probabilities involved and they would do a show at a fringe theatre and then maybe someone from the RSC would come and see them and offer them an audition. Um, so I did that. I lost a lot of momentum during it and I, I couldn't stand the insecurity because I was on and off benefits at the time uh, trying to, uh, you know, keep my head above water because, as I said, London was, was pretty expensive. Oh, and God. um so I just decided to sort of do temping work and eventually it took over. And of course, as a little bit more money comes in, you end up resting on the, the security of that. And in my case, kind of losing momentum in terms of the theatre stuff. So I ended up uh, sort of working in various different kinds of offices for, for char charities. I worked at the Terence Higgins Trust for a while, the Leonard Cheshire Foundation, various other places. Um, Channel 4 for a period. Uh, that was quite interesting because I got tasked with... Um, um, filing everybody's personnel records, so I had a little, had a little look at what people were, and what, <laughs> what there was, some, what the way they were, you know, there was some astonishing things there. I mean, you get like, you know, you know, twenty-five year olds who'd gone to Cambridge working at Channel Four as basically sort of junior commissioning editors, and they'd be on like a hundred grand a year or something like that. It would be just crazy money, and I would just think this is beyond my wildest dreams. But you know, they would all be called Sebastian and Charlotte and all this kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. And you would just know that, you know, that was, I mean, I don't want to sound like a kind of, you know, chip on the shoulder thing, but it is a chip on the shoulder thing in a way, in the, the sense of the, the educational system, if you are pitched at the right level, will get you into opportunities just by having that um, that pedigree uh, in order to get that kind of entree into that world and those connections. So eventually I ended up, the RSC, the Royal Shakespeare Company, was advertising a job in publishing. And I'd done a bit of publishing stuff during my temping, and uh, I went and presented at the RSC, lovely lady called Kathy Elgin, and uh, I, I ended up working there for a couple of years at the Barbican. Um, it was sort of, I, it was a weird combination of experience of having publishing experience and knowing a lot about Shakespeare. Um, and I did that, um, and we, you know, it was an interesting time working at the Royal Shakespeare Company. But I got to see from, you know, the point of view of the other major national company how how the business really worked for actors. And what tends to happen at the Royal Shakespeare Company is you have an ensemble company. I mean, let's say it could be between, I don't know, 30 to 50, 60 actors or something who are taken on of a year. 
and they get given what's called a player's cast contract for 18 months. So that means, you know, if you're a young actor coming out of drama school and they audition you, give you a player's cast contract, you might have three roles in a season. Uh, and generally the pattern was you'd be doing pretty, pretty minor league stuff. Uh, you know, like in, in two of the roles, you might be bringing on a chair <laughs> or something. And in, in, in the third role, you might have a couple of lines. And, um, you know, uh, I, I met a lot of, you know, very, very, very pleasant young actors in the company and got to know them all. And because of the job I did, I was publishing all of their biographies and the programs and things like that. So I got to know a little bit about their lives as well and what they'd done, their experience. And, uh, you know, um, but I also got to see that it, it, it seemed to be a very unsatisfying kind of life because, Whereas in the past, I think the RSC had taken people who'd come from, you know, drama school or maybe even just, you know, just open auditions, which which really never, never happened when I was there and had probably not happened for some time. Um, and these guys do these small roles, but then there wasn't seeming to be much of a career progression for any of them. I mean, in the past, I think it had been that, you know, you get actors like Ben Kingsley or, you know, um, Bob Peck or Ian McKellen. They would have spent seven or eight years with the RSC back in the, you know, in the 70s. Um, so they would have had a good kind of grounding in lots of different uh, plays and roles and, 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 and levels of work. And they would have worked their way up. And, and then generally, you know, once you've become notable there, you might get your first TV roles at the BBC, things like that. And um, as I said, that wasn't really happening by the time I'd got there. In fact, a lot of these young actors were kind of just being churned through. And then the end of their 18 months, you know, some of them might be lucky and get another 18 month contract. But again, it would be the same kind of um, spear carrier things and they wouldn't sort of go anywhere from it and i thought well this is it the company had kind of lost its family ensemble feel which it used to pride itself on and the sense in which people grew uh, and, and did better and were able to aspire in the company had just vanished they were really looking at saying look we've got this play to do let's get a star in or at least you know a relative speaking star in the theater you know not necessarily someone who's massively widely known outside theatre but we'll get the sort of lead actor in and then just cast a bunch of people who are supernumeraries who, who, who ultimately are not really going to go anywhere with this you know so they'll have a good time you know being with the company up in Stratford you know they do the you know the initial summer season they do their three plays in rotation in repertoire so they're very busy they're working very hard and then they get to spend the evenings off at the Dirty Duck pub you know and you know sit, sitting by the river having fun and, and living an actor laddie life. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's quite sad that at the end, you know, some of them just, you know, you just, they don't come back. They just get binned and then they move back into trying to get jobs in, in the fringe again. And, um, you know, hustling or going off to Edinburgh or stuff like that. And it's, it, it wasn't quite a, you know, um, a thing that I thought I really wanted to be part of. Um, yeah. it just, it just felt very, you know, like, a you know, Muck Shakespeare in a way. I mean, that sounds terrible, but the technical excellence of the company is undoubted and especially, the technical people of the company, you know, everything from the lighting people, the stage management, the costume people, the designers, the armourers, all of that stuff is brilliant. I mean, the, the skills are incredibly impressive in-house. Um, and that still retained a lot of the family feel of the company that it had had. You know, people had been there for 20 years or so. Um, and that was really nice to see. Um, but with the actors, it was completely disjointed. And, and, and so you you didn't get that continuity any longer and that sense of people growing up with the company and doing well. So eventually I got made redundant um, in 2002 because mm. the Barbican decided to uh, the RSC decided to leave the Barbican and go as a kind of um, traveling bunch of players throughout yeah. various other theaters and sort of slightly misguided thing. Uh, it was called Project Fleet. And they decided there would be fleet of foot and they would, you know, use theatres in the West End or use theatres here and there, and go off touring in America. And that time they were getting into bed with lots of bigger money because um, the revenue that they'd had from running Les Miserables had sort of teetered down to virtually nothing. So they had to sort of get lots of American philanthropists and foundations to invest in the company and uh, and s start chasing some 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 uh, some moolah and um, which they did. And uh, of course, I was. I was off on my ass again, try, trying to sort of find a, a way back perhaps into theatre, did a little bit more fringe stuff, and then it, it just didn't go anywhere. And so in the early 2000s, I took a job in the NHS, and I worked as a, as a, as a secretary, medical secretary, for a um, very eminent gastroenterologist at King's College Hospital, and um, you know stayed there for four or five years, and eventually um, decided just to become self-employed, doing the same kind of thing for a for uh, for a considerable period of time, about 16 years, mm. 
Right. And uh, and then you know so didn't didn't kind of make it unfortunately in terms of the theatre world. Again, I did bits of Amdram and stuff, but um, I I, <laughs> I think it's not unfair to say I grew increasingly bitter uh, <laughs> about my failure. Well, it to, sounds hard. I mean, I, I yeah, it, it is one of those. It's a pretty brutal um, um, career to have, isn't it? And I mean, even if you're even if you make it and you're successful you can be thrown out on your backside very quickly. You can suddenly just disappear out of um, out of favour, can't you, with the public? Um, mm. I mean, did you... How is... Were you ever interested in things like um, more sort of populist um, sort of TV mm. stuff, you know, the EastEnders it, stuff and things like that, or was that something you weren't it, really interested again, in? Again, it was kind of all closed off. What If you didn't have an agent, you couldn't get the, those sorts of auditions or, or jobs. Right. Um, and so it was a cat was always a catch 22 you know if you hadn't gone to drama school you couldn't get an agent you know uh and uh you know if you couldn't get an agent you couldn't get a job so yep. that was pretty much it and you so you had to you, you could try and sort of persuade people that you were worthy of being on their books as 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 you know having their agent having you uh, their agent uh, having <laughs> being on their books as uh, yeah you yeah. know what i mean I know what uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um but it was it was it was difficult and hard to achieve. Lots of my friends who were acting would would do kind of various things. Like the Cambridge Shakespeare Festival was one route, and it would kind of be you'd all go down to Cambridge for a season in the summer, do some Shakespeare plays, and then maybe 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 some people get agents out of that. Um, I wasn't in a position to be able to do that because I was kind of landed with my flat in London, and it would be very difficult to come back and find another mm. if I kind of had to give it up and go down and and, and work and live in rehearse in cambridge and i just wasn't in the chips enough to do that at the time so it was it was kind of impractical um and and there's always been an expectation that actors will live a kind of sort of peripatetic life when they're younger and go around the country doing various things but i didn't have enough financial security to be able to do that and the friends who did had living situations which were a bit more conducive or they had partners and stuff or whatever um and i was on my tod by then and um so uh, I couldn't sort of see it um, happening uh, for me uh, at that point. And TV stuff, again, it relies on that whole intro to that world through the professional uh, context of, of, of having an agent. Um, so it wasn't a question of you know turning down work because being being too grand. You just didn't know how to get at the work, you know, yeah. you, how to present yourself to the people who were casting. Um, and even though I'd, I'd met people at the RSC, uh, you know, and considered it, I mean, to be honest, they didn't take you seriously if you came back after working at the company and said, look, would you audition me or something like that? They just they just weren't interested. Mm. So, um, yeah, it is it is tough. I mean, I think it's as I say, the important thing is is explaining to people if they want to work in that business is to start very young and is to start with an absolutely firm knowledge. Of this is what you've got to do in terms of being a professional. You can't translate your enthusiasm, you know, as a, as a gentleman amateur, you know, into um into being a professional actor you you have to have something there and uh, so yeah it didn't it didn't happen for me unfortunately um i tried various things setting up my own company i did a production of richard the third um which kind of it was kind of weird it, we did it um in a in a sort of a, a crypt which was under the motorway in wimbledon or merton and it was like an ancient um, site of an abbey merton abbey right and uh and it was kind of a spooky kind of, um, yeah, sort of, it was like the foundations of the old abbey, but it's, it's been preserved underground and we used it and we made up a stage and stuff and did this production, but it was it was far too much work. I tried to both act and direct and mm. I did it with a friend and it ended up with him just acting the role and I directed as best I could, but I ended up with most most of the company walking out on me. Well, they, no, we did, we did the little short season and so on. But um, they all kind of hated me at the end because it was just really, really stressful and really difficult to keep it together. Um, very tough. I mean, the thing as well is, I, I was going to ask you um, yeah. earlier, how do you, because if you've got into somewhere um, and you've got a little bit of a break and you've come in um, mm. doing notes, as you say, with with, uh, with the director, and yeah. you're seen on that side of the, I was going to say camera, but on that side yeah, of yeah, the yeah. You know, audience um, divide. Yeah, the footlights, yeah. Yeah. Then... It must be. Is it difficult to then? Are you then classified yeah. anyway as being right? You're one of those people. There's, 
yeah, there's a profound lack of imagination. I mean, at the time, I was kind of following the example of someone like Kenneth Branagh. I mean, I, I kind of hated Kenneth Branagh because he'd been <laughs> successful. But um, I remember in Australia about 1989, I sort of, I was always, I, um, I, my, my acting he- hero was Laurence Olivier. Yeah. Okay, big Shakespearean actor, Henry V, Richard III, Hamlet, all that stuff. And I'd walked into a news agent one day, and I'd saw the cover of Time magazine, and there was this young actor called Kenneth Branagh on the cover playing Henry V. Yeah. Which and did his great. new did a fantastic job of it, didn't he? But um, it I was a, it was a good film actually. You know, I mean, I didn't like it as much as Olivia's Henry V. I mean, there's various technical reasons, but it was yeah, it was it was like considering the time, considering getting the money together, considering he was about 27, 28 years yeah. old. Um, phenomenal achievement and to get all those actors i mean he'd played seasons at the rsc playing henry the fifth before then from about 1984 so he'd had some good experience and he'd gone to rada and he had the connections and he'd he'd done a good job the lad you can't take that away from him um and he was being touted as the new the new olivier yes and i was really irritated because i thought i was going to be the new olivier (laughs) (laughs) damn so but he did um this thing of being the actor director this which this is the thing that used to happen back in the days you know david garrick and so on and henry irving these people who used to be actor managers and run their own company they would often take the leading role they would direct the show produce and do all sorts of stuff um and he was and they would call them hyphenates at that time actor director and when i was in london trying to say i want to be an actor director i want to do both things i mean the closest person would have been someone like stephen burkoff who who did his own shows for years but um the 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 profession doesn't really understand that they'll just say well which one which one do you want to do acting or directing i said no i want to do both I want to do both of these things. But there's no, of course, there's no context in a company like the RSC. You either are doing one or the other. And, you know, you can do it independently. But as I said, it's incredibly stressful and um, difficult to do. And, of course, you've got to have the money to do it, to, well, to, to set up productions. You've probably got to have, I mean, a lot of famous actors, both film actors and stage actors, get to be directors, don't they? But And, and also TV yeah. actors. But it's normally yeah. because they've got the power, haven't they? They're, they're the star. So they yeah, make a turn yeah. around and say, yeah, I'm going to direct this, and then I'm going to produce this as well. So, yeah, um, that's it. People like, and, I mean, in TV, Seinfeld, and people like that, or um, yeah. what's his name in, um, oh, what's the other American? Uh, one of my favourite ones, Frasier. Yeah, um, yeah, really. yeah, that sort of thing. So, yeah. but otherwise, though, I can imagine if you haven't got, if you haven't got, if you aren't coming into it with power, then trying to say yeah. I'm doing these two things. Burkoff, most of his things, one man shows. He, I think he had done some one man stuff. I don't know too much about the history of his career, actually. There's just a few things he did which influenced me. Um, but he led companies. He did a very famous production of Hamlet back in the Roundhouse in about 1980, which is amazing. And he wrote a book about it, which I found is one of my favorite books. And, and I'd seen him in Australia. He'd come out with a national theater production of Oscar Wilde's Salome. And uh, I'd you know, gone and, you know, um, met him back you know, in the bar afterwards and stuff and tried to have a chat with him. And um, and we used to get quite a few touring productions through Perth, actually. It was quite an international theatre stop-off because they had a big festival every year, the Arts Festival. And the favourite thing I'd seen was a, a, a company called the English Shakespeare Company who were, um, it was started by Michael Bogdanoff, a director, and Michael Pennington, an actor, who had both worked at the RSC and for perhaps similar reasons were quite dissatisfied with it so they set up their own touring company called the esc the english shakespeare company and they did the uh, shakespeare history cycle the wars of the roses from richard ii to richard iii um and it was a fantastic production it's what made me want to really be an actor um and again they had um you know they got funding um through a couple of canadian bankers the mervish brothers and they had uh, you know phenomenal phenomenally successful world tour you know it was one of the big highlights of the 80s and um uh, and again, it was it was kind of ended up being a sort of flash in the pan because it, it, the company lasted perhaps for another maybe another ten years or so, and then it got, kind of kind of sort of frittered away, uh, and and you know just didn't do an awful lot anymore. You know, it sort of um, it, 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 companies they say have their own natural life, and it's generally about seven years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, companies that go longer than that are you know, slightly freakish, but you know for various reasons they kind of spiral apart and you know don't don't continue. Um, so, yeah, um, so, yeah, I was just, you know, having to kind of adjust to this idea that um, the, you know, the dream of being a, a classical actor was kind of receding and, uh, you know, <laughs> drawing, drawing onwards to the, you know, sort of my early middle age and, um, you know, try, trying to sort of adjust to the fact that it probably wasn't going to happen for me, no matter how hard I tried. I think the, the theatre in particular is one of the last big bastions of class and um if you're going to use the word privilege in this country, mm. in the sense of 
um, it's it's just largely tied down to people of you know middle class background who can afford to get sent to drama school and then have connections and stuff. I mean, it's no coincidence when you look at some of the younger actors who've come out in the last 15, 20 years, like people like Eddie Redmayne or you know, Benedict Cumberbatch. You know, there's usually a history of people who've basically gone to Eton or a public school, yeah. gone to Cambridge, and daddy's an investment banker. And <laughs> so that's yeah. the kind of background. It's not necessarily saying that they get strings pulled in that way, but they're in an echelon of society, which means you can kind of uh, accelerate into the business in a way that I saw happen that you would see i worked at the gate theater in notting hill for a while uh, under a director called mick gordon back in the late 90s and i was just basically again assisting the producer and i would see people come through and it would all be people who you know um let's say five ten years later would go on to be kind of you know household names in directing and theater and stuff um and actors as well i mean i remember david yellowo uh, came and did a show there um you know and again these people before before they come famous but they mm-hmm. it's it's weird it's almost like they are propelled you know you you find these people come and do a show you've never really heard of them but then all the publicity just kind of comes out of nowhere you know suddenly they're in articles you know in in sunday supplements and you know people are interviewing them and all sorts and it's not necessarily just because of the background of the work they just kind of have arrived and and it's almost like they're being kind of created for the scene to a certain extent i'm not saying they're not talented people there's many very very talented people in there david yellower was terrific actor um he did uh he played in the um when the royal shakespeare company did um the history plays he played henry the sixth and he was terrific and uh he certainly had talent but you, you could see how certain actors certain directors were just kind of flavor of the month and they were kind of being you know um propelled along um, almost on it, you're gliding along serenely, <laughs> you know, into a into a into a good career, and you just felt these people lived on a sort of level of the clouds that you you couldn't quite reach onto. Um, so yeah, I kind of I kind of gave up on it really, um, and uh, you know, by this time I'm sort of drifting into my late 30s and early 40s, and uh, you know, just just working in essentially you know admin job type stuff, and then you know, eventually I get to where I am. Uh, more or less now really just someone who has got involved in the culture war scene mm. and um has decided to you know start a twitter account and start just doing streaming because um i was very activated by the the sort of things that happened i guess back in the 2010s um you know to do with you know uh, events around the world you know in particular this uh, the charlie hebdo attacks in 2015 really woke me up yeah, and um, you know, I don't know about you. I don't know if you were engaged by that at that point. I was. I was. Um, well, I was, I was engaged. I was very. I was incredibly concerned about it all. Um, pretty, yeah. pretty. I would probably passed red pill even back then. To be honest, I was probably, mm. probably on certain days anyway, fairly black pilled. Um, uh, to mm. use the terminology, even then, I didn't realise that those problems were only going to be a small part of the problems that we were going to get later later on. Um, mm. Because I think the cultural side of things and the um, the um, fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism that we've seen and all the rest of it, which was every it was the big problem, really, wasn't it? A few years ago, mm. and um, I'm sure it hasn't gone away. Um, mm. And certainly, given recent events, I don't see any real chance of it going away. But um, but we've got so many other things that are happening, which we've talked about. Yeah. Um, so I was very much into it and aware of it and concerned by it but i wasn't really doing anything about it and I, um you mm. know it, it wasn't taking an active part it's interesting how things have gone with ironically with things like youtube and mm. and twitter and what have you and, and they do help in terms of people connecting with each other and and understanding that there are other people out there that feel similar to you or i think the same as you or mm. that overlap which is ironic given the fact that some um, these platforms do everything they can to try and censor um so many people's views um yeah uh, you know i think as soon as you get to a certain size and have any impact then suddenly all of a sudden yeah you've you've got to be building another platform somewhere because you know your your time is limited i think that's the big problem Mm -hmm. yes Um, absolutely Mm -hmm. i mean so are you based sort of southeast still or are you um, Mm. no i live in the midlands now i mean I, i lived in london for 18 years and i was um quite a wrench to leave in, in in many ways it was easy in others london was becoming increasingly unbearable to live in it was becoming overcrowded you know increasingly noisy harsh 
violent. Um, I lived in for the last eight years. I lived in South London in Brixton, right. and and it was getting you know quite quite spicy on the streets. And it just also got to a point where it was becoming cripplingly expensive. And um, I I just had to leave, so I moved up to the Midlands. You know, set up here. Um, you know, a f- few years after being here, bought a house. And, um, you know, plonk myself down and, you know, I'm just trying to kind of recalibrate uh, my life by engaging in this kind of stuff, really. It's hmm. it's sort of not, not not exactly a calling to do anything like this, but it's just um, you're wanting to engage with it all and just also seeing that sometimes you're dissatisfied with what you're hearing back from these, you know, social media uh, arenas and and mainstream media arenas and it just provokes you into going look if i want to say something or, or or try and change something i've got to do it myself there's just literally no opportunity like i'd learned with the acting world where anybody's going to call you in and say what do you think about this you know why, why, why don't you why don't you come and do a show or something and so you just have to do this kind of glorious diy thing and create I guess a sense of a conversation as I've often talked with you about, about creating an ecology of interest whereby people who increasingly feel alienated from the mainstream media and and the messaging that the persistent and overpowering messaging that comes from not just the media, but from all angles of culture and and politics uh, and, uh, and society and, and feeling you want to react, you want to push back. You just want to say, no, I don't agree. I want something I want a different kind of world and you become much more outward looking in that sense at that point you start to look at how people live and their situations and what they want and what they're doing and you know you 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 become a little less self-absorbed as you as you are when you're wanting to be an actor and be a kind of you know successful product and you're just living life you know with everybody else and seeing that it's yeah it's it's a tough it's a tough, you know, kind of world to live in if you're not, if you're in what they call the precariat, that sort of segment of the population who perhaps are not living with continuous jobs or very high pay, you know, or yeah. a decent standard of living. And you're just kind of shuffling from one thing to the next. And I think there's an awful lot of people like that now. And, mm. and you begin to identify with the kinds of struggles that they have and friends who are trying to sort of launch businesses or who are just trying to sort of sustain themselves from from you know, month to month. Yeah. Uh, things like buying a house. You begin to look at the metrics of, of life and you begin to feel very you know aggrieved about it it's not through a sense of missed entitlement it's a sense that everyone should perhaps be able to at least achieve or aspire to achieve and and realistically garner uh, some kind of little corner of, of 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 the world for themselves and it just seems to be so hard for everybody uh, you know who's in that sort of sector i mean there's there's a lot of people who are you know i'm all right jack pull the ladder up and uh, they're doing fine um, and that's probably a sort of, you know, a reasonable s- segment of the population. But I think there's an increasing number of people who are who are alienated from the, the sense of the, the the ambition of their own lives. And they find it harder and harder to see their, you know, their their lives grow, you know, to to, you know, have just to like grow the income in their job. You know, you need to sort of earn a bit more money in order to buy a house and then to have a family and, and do all these other things. And I've seen a lot of people whose opportunities were kind of cut off through not being able to operate and earn and participate at that level and it's it's also a factor of the economic situation that we've had whereby we've had a, a glut of unskilled labor we've had you know the retrenchment of jobs we've had the exporting of uh, work overseas the outsourcing uh, of jobs uh, and and you know increasingly we seem to be living in a service economy uh, and one in which there are very few opportunities unless you are very specifically highly skilled in certain niche areas to earn a decent wage, save up, get ahead, and you know just things like, as I say, buying a house. You know, um, it's it's many many multiples of of the the average salary, and yeah. and even you know the average salary in this country can be a bit of a joke. I mean, I think it used to be about sort of twenty seven thousand, twenty eight thousand. I, I never earned the average salary in, in all my time in Britain. It was, it was, it was, it was probably an indication for people who were largely working in public sector jobs. Um, you know, well, quite... I think the the average salary now is probably thirty, isn't it? About thirty thousand. And um, uh, if you look at net, that's probably take home. That's probably two thousand pounds a month, something like that. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. And two thousand pounds a month 
um, if you've got to pay rent and everything else, it's, it's not like you're living the high life. But um, no. uh, a lot of people, of course, are earning. And if you, um, I mean, this last 18 months, I've been looking around at, at other things and what could I do to fill yeah. the gaps because I'm sort of self-employed and all the rest of it. And um, I've looked at what everyone else has looked at. A lot of actors have looked at things like, you know, well, shall I go and deliver for Tesco or something? And you mm. look at, the, the, um, I looked into it and they they will pay you um, they will employ you on a zero hours contract. Um, they can't guarantee how many hours you'll have every week. They yeah. might, that you might get four hours or you might get 14 hours. Um, but it, certainly at the beginning, you don't get many. And then I think you get about, um, I think it's about 12 pounds an hour or something. Yeah. Um, and they, they'll ring you up um, at Saturday, Saturday night at nine o'clock and say, right, you're on the six o'clock shift tomorrow for four or six mm. hours. Mm. Um, mm. And I just looked at it and thought, no, I'm not going to do that. That's ridiculous. It it, it completely yeah. limits what you can do. But lots of people live like that. Um, and yeah. I, it's it's not far away from serfdom, is it really? You're just no. at the beck and no. call of some big corporation. If yeah. you're doing 10 hours a week, you're getting £120 a week, £6,000 a year. <laughs> Mm. And then you've mm. got to try and supplement your income. But of course, the reason people can live like that, a lot of people, is that they, if they, yeah. if they've got family or they're married or whatever else, they then get a fairly significant uplift from yeah. government. So, yeah. um, which probably makes their salary up to forty thousand or something, because you know, net, um, yes, equivalent. Which I'd never realised. But there's so many people must be on that. Um, that sort mm. of um, what's it called? Working tax credits. Um, That's it. Yeah. Which is UBI effectively, isn't it? Sort of. Um, yeah. And then it leaves people. I, I love that word. What was that word you said? The the, the precariat. The precariat. I like that. Um, growth, a sort of growth sector of people who are just kind of under these average wages. You know, who are not getting any of these tax benefits. Who are, you know, um, you know, as you say, living living in sort of McJob type job situations or being shunted from redundancy into benefits and and back into temporary work and so on. So it's yeah, it's a, you know, a, the job for life thing obviously ended some time ago. Um, yeah. As I, say, as I say, unless you're in certain public sector areas. And, of course, that's been, you know, the massive kind of um, um, constituency to which government appeals now. Uh, the, you know, the Blair government, you know, created and, and enhanced and consolidated the client state of people who owe their jobs to government, um, whether it was the NHS or whether it was the police back at the time or, you know, any other public sector or, you know, um, part public uh, organisation you could think of. So... And this in itself is also tied into the way a lot of the political agendas have manifested culturally because the kinds of people who are uh, gainfully employed by taxpayer money, um, you know, uh, it's no coincidence that they tend to align with with certain soft left liberal positions in in culture and politics yeah. and the nature of organizations being what they are you know conquests law of politics is they tend to become more left-wing over time and they they you know add to that part of the consensus engine that um drives the you know the current the current agenda so the, these things sort of work in in uh, all in in uh, you know synchrony with um you know taxpayer funded jobs and of course the private sector um to a certain extent has has been cut back or has been you know um you know redeployed or you know outsourced uh, you know much of the stuff that um you know government needs for instance in terms of procurement comes from you know outside the country from china uh, or it comes from you know sort of cozy contractual arrangements within the country that have been like that for a long time it's very difficult for anybody to break into you know small business uh you know or, or creating their own sort of you know um business world now i think you know it's it's a it, 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 crushing amount of regulation and taxes um that mean people i mean i know people have just been saying to me with their small businesses they're just treading water all the time they never get ahead yeah they never never make a success of it it is i mean I, um i i went i started my business because in 92 and i was in a corporate um during that sort of recession that we had mm. in 92 there was um um you may have heard this if you were listening to me talking to London Raider, but basically I had a period of um, probably something approaching uh, 18 months, two years, where I was unemployed. And the first six months, uh, I was 27 back then, and the first six mm. months were fun because I was mm. I had a bit of money and I had been earning quite I was earning, at the time, mm. two or three times the salary of most of my peers from mm. uni. So I was 
doing quite well. And so I had a bit of money in the bank and everything else. Um, I was in a relationship at the time. Um, and um, I, I, it was great, really. I had a, I had six months of not having to worry too much. And then after six months, I started concentrating on trying to find something. And, you know, then you start thinking, oh, actually, I've been out of it for a while now. Um, and and your know, CV starts to look less um, good because you have been out of it. So, so um and of course, it was a, there was a recession. So trying to get um, a job, I was in, in property, trying to get a job acquiring property or doing property development during a recession is pretty mm. difficult. So mm. I went through a similar sort of um, thing. And eventually I became self-employed because I couldn't find anyone to employ me. Um, yeah. And thankfully it worked out. It did reasonably okay. But um, uh, and, until I uh, you know, basically had enough of it. But I've got friends that um, were are corporate machines, you know, corporate animals. Mm. And they work in quite big jobs, um, some mm. of them. Some of them very mm. big jobs. And um, mm. they're, I mean, they're, they're articulate, intelligent um, people, good with people, good, you know, very, um, uh, you could see why they are where they are. But mm. they are perhaps, I'm guesstimating here, they're, they're working for big either big or private organizations or public bodies mm. and they're probably earning they're probably charging as a as a on a day rate as a, mm. as a consultant about um 1500 pounds a day 2000 pounds a day wow yeah and you go and they're probably doing three days a week so mm. what's that um pounds a year for three day a week and wow. you go well you know i mean they're impressive people but they're mm. not mm. um they're not that much yeah. better, you know. They're not. You think, well, how how can that be the case? And yet, um, um, we're friends. We obviously have a lot in common, and we, um, mm. uh, you know, we talk and we obviously rate each other. Otherwise, we wouldn't be friends. Um, yeah. And yet, um, yeah, I'm looking at twelve pounds. I mean, again, it sounds yeah. like it, it, it. I'm not saying well, I'm I should be due fifteen hundred pounds a day. You know, you build a <laughs> career, and I sort of bugged out sure. from time to time. But yeah. surely the difference between twelve pounds an hour and fifteen hundred pounds a day for two people that can conduct a serious conversation yeah. amongst each the, the two of them, um, yes. th there's something wrong there, isn't there? Um, especially yeah. as a lot of what this particular person I'm thinking of, um, yeah. who I, uh, if he if he listens to this, uh, uh, <laughs> no, he knows I don't um, I don't resent any of it. He works very hard, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, it just doesn't make there's, yeah. there's too big a gap. There's too big a yeah. gap, you know. I mean, what's yeah. wrong with competent people earning you know, sixty or seventy thousand pounds? I mean, the only people I know of that earn that sort of money now, mm. I mean, I know lots of people earning a hundred thousand pounds a year. Yeah, and um, they all um, they're either head teachers or heads of year, mm. or they work for the NHS in a admin role. Um, mm. But you know, it's sort of I don't know what grade you have but at, you know mm. sort of a middle grade or something like that um mm. or middle middle to high grade yeah. um or i don't know anybody in the bbc but um uh well actually i do i've met a couple of people that work in the bbc and i suspect they're on sort of you know eighty thousand, ninety thousand, or something like that in a fairly yeah. junior role yeah um you, if you look in the guardian all you see is jobs on um 60 to one hundred and fifty thousand pounds exactly yeah. and they're non-jobs most of them aren't they um, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a, either a kind of hyper specialization about the job. You know, it often requires a combination of skills, which you think, well, Jesus, that is like me with my job at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Very few people, you know, know know enough about publishing and know lots about Shakespeare. So it's weird sort of, you know, um, mixes of, of skills that people have. But it's also, as you say, they've grown up in certain career sectors where maybe there was emergent kinds of role uh, which you know um, have, have subsequently become highly prized or also I think factored into this is a sort of hyper managerialism there's always there seems to be an always ever increasing outgrowth of management sector yeah. type jobs or communication sector type jobs and this was a sort of real thing from the 80s that the cold communications class people who worked in marketing and and people who who worked in corporate comms you know and and, and all these kind of you know compliance kind of areas and things really kind of burgeoned yeah. and and as you say a lot of them seem like if you looked at a company 50 60 years ago of course these jobs kind of just wouldn't have existed or would have been done by somebody managing two or three of the areas at once and you feel that a lot of them as you say are kind of that you know they're not um 
they're not necessarily crucial to the the capitalist process of production of fulfilling supply and demand although they are a kind of area of um you know augmentation of the process to make it i guess seem more professionalized or more kind of corporatized or more you know globally kind of integrated in some sense and and of course yes there's a degree to which the burgeoning of regulation has led to the sort of growth of these kinds of positions as well so there's a lot of people who know perhaps in a lot of detail about very niche kind of areas to do with the interplay between government and business or or you know the um, you know the the, the current industri- industry practices that 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 they're kind of not exactly irreplaceable but they they're, they're bred over a long period and so perhaps they do arrive in these sort of odd positions and 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 from the outside they can look a lot of them as as we say yes they can look sort of like non jobs or they could be very sort of particular you know clusters of skills in one person or or persons that um you know perhaps are just um i don't know you know they're just very much in in orientation with the the corporate or, or government culture of the time you know it's like things like diversity officers and stuff like that that you know the classic things that we all sort of make fun of but you know you you get the sense of <laughs> not necessarily that these are wholly useful positions um and at the same time there's all these regulatory requirements that say to people, well, you must have this kind of policy and you must have this kind of sort of corporate take. A lot of it's best practice, isn't it? You, you've got to meet best practice and best practice is you must have this person to do this, otherwise you're exposed to this, this and this and, and the yeah. litig- litigation culture and yeah. all this sort of stuff. I mean, um, mm. funnily enough, today I was just going off topic slightly, but um, um, when I was, I knew we were going to be speaking and I was just looking through and what's happening today and what have you and I noticed that, um, um, who is it, um, Nirvana. Have you have you read this thing about Nirvana? Yes, about somebody, uh, the guy who was on the cover of um, Nevermind. Uh, yes, the baby that was, um, yeah, sort of, um, <laughs> and he is now 30 and is suing Nirvana for, um, uh, I think, for uh, child exploitation child and, and molestation. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. the, the would baby think, in the you, pool, if you, if, yeah. I mean... I'd be dining out on that forever. I would be really, it's rather cool, but he's actually literally going for that. That's where we are yeah. as a society, isn't it? I mean, I know it's America, yeah. but, and probably yeah. Portland or somewhere like that. But I mean, even so, oh God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you say, there's always, I mean, yeah, there, there is a kind of, um, um, it's something of an exploitative culture in many ways, you know, not just in that kind of, you know, very lurid kind of way, but um, in, in the sense of people, you know, I- I- exploiting the, continuous growth and propagation of all of these kinds of non-job areas if you see what i mean you know mm-hmm. you know that you know, people don't have any interest in undermining their own area of business they want to propagate it they want to keep it going and they want to you know give it a level of seriousness you know and a level of presentability to the public and and the notion that well uh, this is crucial this is essential this kind of work and of course a lot of that gets you know fixed in the public public consciousness as oh well yes yes we must have these kinds of jobs and you know of course if, if, as I say, you brought company directors back from, you know, 60, 70 years ago, they'd look at a lot of this stuff and say, well, that can go, that can go, that can go, that's a waste of time. Yeah. You know, let, let's just crack on and, you know, make widgets and sell them. And that's who, kind of what we need to do. It's um, Who was the um, the guy in the in the 80s? So it would have been perhaps before your time, but um, mm. uh, the, the old English guy with a moustache that wrote a few books on business, and he was the original... Uh, problem solver and um oh what was his name um big bushy moustache not to be able to remember him now um mm. but he was exactly that he would go in he was called something digby like, jones was he the guy no it's before digby jones it was digby right. jones was like his the, the, the next one in yeah um yeah sir somebody and i can't remember i should, really should know his name but anyway yes. he, he wrote several books and all the rest of it but he was exactly that he would come in and troubleshoot yeah. i think he was called the troubleshooter actually and he would come in yeah troubleshoot businesses and it was no nonsense, you know, cut away the fat. Um, yeah. I mean, my, I'm old enough now to be relatively cynical on things. Um, and mm. uh, one of the things that I look at now with businesses. Was it um, Sir Harvey? Someone Sir Harvey, um, yes, um, uh, it was him. Sir Harvey. Yes, I know I know who you mean, actually, now. Um, but it was Harvey, 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 something or other. I can't recall. But anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, I guess some people are probably shouting it. But um, <laughs> anyway, so he was... He was um, very good, but I think one of the at the time back in the what was the early nineties when I was made redundant, I used to work for. Um, in fact, I worked for what at the time was Trust House Forte, and then became Forte, which yeah. is a big hotel group. 
and um, that was my first job out of um, out of uni. And um, mm. so Harvey Jones, so Harvey, Harvey Jones, Jones, that was it, that was it. Yeah, and um, they were quite a good company. Um, obviously, Rocco Forty was he ran it like a family firm to a large yeah. extent, and he was criticised when he was taken over by Granada for being on the golf course, and not that that was relevant, but it was all PR at the time. Um, mm. He though, um, they it was a it was a very good business when I worked there originally and then Granada came in and they basically just stripped out everything mm. took all the best bits of out up to the bottom line and then mm. got out of Dodge so you know sold out mm. and profit and yeah haven't we done well and then of course the business fell apart over the next 15 years because they had you know the restaurants that used to have three or four people working them in an evening yeah, uh, somebody at the counter, somebody clearing the table, somebody doing the cooking, somebody doing the washing up and all of yeah. a sudden uh, there was one person doing it all, and so that you've got yeah. the tables were stacking up with, you know, you can imagine it was just the business was re- it was accountants had gone in, destroyed yes. the business, improved the bottom line, got out, yes. everything fell apart, and I mean, Little yeah. Chef was one of their major brands and was the only restaurant brand on the on the roadside, apart from one or two like AJ's, which had about half a dozen, and yeah. uh, Happy Eater, which they then bought. So they, I, well, I was buying for Little Chef at the time. And um, I remember going to my boss in 92, just before I was made redundant, and saying, um, I, there's McDonald's drive throughs um, I'm, I'm competing against that, them now with sites. Yeah. Uh, I think they're, you know, they're, they're obviously a danger. Uh, well, I did a presentation, I think, actually, to, the, to my director on it. Yeah. And then it went up to the main board and it came back and they said, uh, McDonald's aren't a threat to uh, Little Chef. <laughs> um, right. Well, we're a Little Chef now then. So, um, so yes, I suppose, I don't know. But, but, but what I was going to say was, I knew mm. that they were uh, on a hiding to nothing when they changed their name from Trust House Forte to Forte and spent about mm. Um, mm. £20 million pounds changing all their branding. Yeah. When, whenever a corporate uh, entity yeah. Yeah. starts rebranding itself, yeah. they're lost. That's the only yeah, thing yeah. they can think of to do. Yeah. So, well, yeah. But it, yeah, it was it was it was it was yeah, it was extension of that kind of age that started in the sixties with the corporate asset strippers, people like Jim Slater and Jimmy Goldsmith. Yeah. And it ended up being the kind of organizational course, corporate asset stripping of, you know, as you say, the people who actually you need to do the work. But of course, you know, labor is one of the highest costs and is always, as you say, best reflected on the bottom line by being removed yeah. <laughs> from the company. Yeah. And of course the the efficiencies don't necessarily translate in certain businesses like hospitality into, uh, you know, uh, optimum service. You know, they just become, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you've got redundant spaces and assets that then need to be, you know, sold off or, or whatever. You know, and then of course, when you're doing that sort of thing, you need to protect yourself because of employment law, and so then personnel mm. becomes a big industry. And um, I know several people that worked in personnel, um, mainly women. It's more of a female kind of dominated profession. And um, mm. when I was younger, again in my twenties and early thirties, I knew quite a lot of personnel officers, and I, I in fact had one as a lodger for a while. And that profession, I have no respect for whatsoever. I mean, oh, I, they're vile. Yeah. They are just. I mean, the stories I used to hear. She, it may, of course, have just have been this particular person. But yeah. She was ruthless. Heartless yeah. Ruth. She worked for a big corporation where nobody really cared other than doing a professional job. And she would hack people's pensions off them with like one week to go and some mm. poor bloke who's like 58 and about to be entitled to a pension. And she'd chop him out because it meant that he didn't get a pension or his yeah. pension was 50%. And she would come home and say, oh, I've done a great job today. I've done this, that and the other. And you think, it's not like I could kind of it would still be bad and unfair, mm. but if it was your own business and you were yeah. saving that money for your own business and your own family and everything else, you could at least say, well, it's ruthless um, and mm. heartless, but yeah, you are doing it for yourself. When you're doing mm. it for a big corporation that frankly yeah. doesn't give a damn about you, why would yeah. you do that to somebody else? I just don't mm. understand that at all. Yeah. But yeah. it was a lot of it about at, at that time, and um, 
I, and I don't suppose it's any better now. Thankfully, I've been out of the corporate world for a very long time now. So, um... Well, it's a relief, isn't it? You don't have to go on any of these courses that people have to go on nowadays to improve their social status. You know, I mean, it, but I think it's a worthy thing to say. You know, there's nothing human about human resources, is there, no. in terms of the quality of the people you meet? Um, but, you know, as you say, the corporate culture now is, is, is sort of, you know, again, ever more tightly interwoven with the, with the demands of, you know, regulatory compliance with whatever the social agenda is or whatever you know um regulatory um constraints are imposed by things like being part of the european union of course hmm. which from which we uh, uh, allegedly have freed ourselves apparently but, uh, so <laughs> yeah yeah I, the sunlit uplands beckon um, i'm just i'm just not feeling the warmth yet uh, of that but no. um and, well of course apart from the fact that all the groceries it's difficult to get groceries now and everybody is saying that it's brexit but i um <laughs> Which is, I am getting so sick of, luckily I was away for most of the Brexit um, yeah. debate, if you can call it that. Um, yeah. I was um, I was in the States at the time, so I missed, I did vote um, by post or whatever, but I, I, I mm. missed all of the lead up to it. But I'm told by my brother that it was horrendous, that um, mm. Mm. the stuff that happened and the... The, the Joe Cox, the way the Joe Cox um, yeah. murder was, 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 was spun um, mm. was just shameless, really. And, uh, I mean, it mm. still is. I mean, his, was it her sister now that's just got in as an MP? And you just yeah, think, well... Yeah, that's right. Is that yeah. the reasoning that you're now an MP just because you were... The, the you know the, the uh, you lost your sister to a violent act? I mean, it, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. But anyway, I'm um, going off off topic. So so just to get back, because mm. we are we are we've just broken the hour, and I um I don't want to um go on <laughs> to for, for for too long. But getting mm. we we talked about you, which I hope mm. um people will find uh, interesting, because mm. we don't hear a lot about you normally. You're normally doing a stoic and wonderful job with other people. So um mm. and um you have turned your interest to mm. what's happening the culture wars as you say yeah yeah um yeah. so you um i saw you first or, or came across you first when you were doing uh this job for uh, d d uh doing the um uh, yeah what what do you call it the um the, the live streams for james the, yes and uh, the moderating yeah. and and, yeah. and i think yeah. probably you were helping him with with yeah yeah because i had a, i have a lot invested in in the delling polls you know um i mean first of all i really like james and dick and yeah. i felt they were expressing um certainly james in his journalism the kinds of views i had it was kind of a no-brainer it's not um that i you know I, i'd come across them through as I said, my activation of the culture wars was after the Charlie Hebdo um, massacre. And I'd started looking at things that Douglas Murray had been saying. And through Douglas, I found the the early incarnation of London Calling um, when James was doing. Uh, actually, he had a previous radio show called Radio Free Dellingpole. And then he yes. changed it to London Calling and he would interview people like Douglas and Milo Yiannopoulos, who was a thing back then. And, yep. you know, very interesting people. Breitbart, weren't they together? Yeah, yeah. And he was because he was. Yeah. So, um I just got really into that voice because he he's kind of in a way we're sort of similar temperamentally. Um, there's something I like about him that's very mischievous, um, but very kind of he knows what he likes. And he knows what he doesn't like. He's got a very, very powerful moral sense, mm. um, which which I share in, in, in pretty much most respects. I think we're probably very similar kind of old fashioned conservatives. I had thought, I guess, for a long time that I was a kind of classical liberal. And I just began to realize that um, while there are many appealing things about being a classical liberal, um, it was the liberalism bit <laughs> that was causing a lot of the problems because it, it kind of waves through a whole load of things on the grounds of, well, you know, people are free to do X, Y and Z. And and yes, I appreciate that, you know, freedom and liberty are, are wonderful qualities. And I don't think that they're things that are alien to a conservative either. I think it's more that conservatives are saying, yes, you can be free, but have you asked yourself what's the purpose of your freedom? You know, mm. it's not so much I can do this. Conservatives want to ask themselves, should you do this? Is it the judicious choice? Is it the best choice for yourself, for your community, for your society? And I started to get this sort of sense that actually I probably was lying to myself a bit, that I, I wasn't necessarily all that liberal, although I cling to certain, you know, notions that people think of as liberal i do believe in people you know being able to say what they they want to say I, I like the idea of free speech and you know being able to choose you know have a moral agency um but sometimes i think you know there's a lot of the exercise of free speech now which is kind of 
um, vapid and perhaps somewhat passive aggressive and even sometimes vicious that people do want to just say things to wind up certain other people or certain communities in order to feel uh, a sense of propriety and a sense of ownership of the public space and maybe just to, just to act out a sense of hostility to other people. So, I mean, of course, on the one hand, you have all the kind of social justice crew telling us all of these, using their free speech, you know, to yep. tell us that we're all terrible people, you know, we're all sort of post-colonial and, you know, privileged and toxic and all of these kinds of things. And And I think I've got a problem with that kind of free speech. I don't. It's not so much that I don't think a man can should be able to to you know not say things. Uh, you know, he should be constrained or prevented. But I think I'm looking for a society where people have a bit more of a sense of moral due diligence on the speech that they're exercising, um, and thinking about how um, it contributes to the the promulgation of certain kinds of culture which are inimical to the society you know so if you're telling you know young lads that they're they're toxic if you're you know telling the white working class that they're all bigoted and racist um you know if if you're you know um you know there's, there's all sorts of attacks on various different people everybody takes a beating now it seems except for for certain sort of protected categories yeah. if you're constantly doing that you're reinforcing a sense of people being on the defensive of being um paralyzed by by uh, uh you know fear or by um a sense of guilt you know a sense of original sin that they have to kind of make amends for and this provides a great kind of um, sort of you know wedge for for people who are essentially the enemies of a society to drive into and begin to split apart the bonds that keep us together as a, a functioning society and i think the unit of of society that best works is the nation i mean this is a not you know remarkable or, or original conservative kind of belief but i think that's the optimum sized unit for people to work in you know families you know within communities within nations um the 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 whole European Union thing, of course, offended me because I think you can't you can't coordinate societies of varying culture uh, and varying ethnicity in in a sort of you know transnational project like that. It's a kind of it's a kind of mathematical. It's kind of an arithmetic logic for a lot of people. It's kind of business logic of, you know, rationalizing a company, you know, and bringing things together and creating economies of scale. But I think the thing about, you know, the free market is, yes, it's it's wonderful that, you know, capitalism can provide the the um, the the means by which, you know, we can enhance things like our standard of living and our, our standard of personal prosperity and our ability to enjoy our lives and to do wonderful things technologically but it's it's increasingly you know vacant of answers uh, about should we be doing certain sorts of things and and i think we're not questioning things at a moral level enough anymore i think we've decided that you know any problem can be solved by the marketization of the solution it can be outsourced to the ingenuity of of the uh, the economic system, yeah. and I think there's got to be a dimension in there where people say, well, yes, of course, you know, we can, we can send all this business over to, over to China and do it much much more cheaply, but then we can also at the same time in doing so we can destroy a tradition of manufacturing or or of craftsmanship or of um, you know, native skill in certain things which actually contribute more than just the sum of their parts if you see what i mean to I, I think that's where they've got where i think we've conservatives have lost their way mm. uh is that uh, um and i mean i've got a lot of time obviously for uh well i presume obviously for margaret thatcher and some of the stuff she had to do in the yeah. late 70s and early 80s because we yeah. were a basket case i was old enough to remember the, of course, know, three-day weeks and all the rest of it. Oh, um, it was a mess. Yeah. So it's a total mess. So a lot of what she did seems to have worked. Uh, seemed to yeah. work. And it was, certainly, we were a very different country. Ten. It kind of years had later. to happen. It wasn't yeah. just that you know she came in willfully saying there's going to be a few changes for the hell of it. It was like these things had to happen. We were being held ransom by the unions. You know, people's standard of living, which in some ways was improving, was also you know deteriorating simultaneously. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Go on. But no, no, I mean, um, yeah, home ownership. So for that generation, yeah. I was kind of on the edge of it, but I didn't, for various reasons, didn't really um, uh, take full advantage of it. But yeah. Um, but yeah, for that generation, it was a, a great boon. My view always with home ownership coming from a property background was mm. that it seemed to me fairly obvious that once you have an entire population with large debt, 
Yeah. You can control the economy with a monetary policy by mm. simply just putting up interest rates. Nobody can spend any money. So yeah. I was quite suspicious of that. Um, the reality is that, of course, a lot of people did very well off it. But now we're paying a price because uh, the average house price is something like eight or nine times the average wage. So, mm. Mm. you know, there is an entire generation now uh, many many of which will never get onto the housing ladder until something yeah. changes so so yeah. there's that but where i think i was going with it with this was that i think conservatism and capitalism were hand in hand but somewhere along the line we we kept the capitalism uh, mm. and we've lost the conservatism so yes. the fact that um it used to be that if you were um a wealthy industrialist mm. your peers expected that you would like for instance, Bourneville, for example, that you yeah. would you would build the community, uh, not everybody, but you know many of them would build a community mm. of of homes and yes. churches and um, uh, playing fields and cricket fields and everything else because um, you you were a philanthropist and you wanted to improve the lot of the working man um, and you could argue that well it's better than if you build everybody houses and let them live in your houses and mm. play cricket on your play, uh, playing fields um, mm. it's probably cheaper in the long run than paying them the sort of wage they'd need to have that quality of life but mm. I don't really care as long as people are getting that quality of life so mm. um, uh, and you know they've, they've, they don't have any uh, obligation to um, fill your bank account necessarily but they mm. can pay you for a living wage and then they can make mm. your life better by improving housing and, and reducing infant mortality and all that sort of stuff so so I think conservatism and capitalism merged mm. and then capitalism kind of took over conservatism we don't really have conservatism mm. well you only have to look at the tory party now yeah. to know that we don't have conservatism yeah. we have this globalist globo homo um totally. it's yeah. just horrendous isn't it it's the worst of both mm. worlds really we've got yeah. um we have we don't have we have um capitalism, we have hyper-capitalist which is, neoliberalism that's, essentially Yep. Yes, you put it so much better. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's the problem. And I noticed yesterday when you were talking to um, uh, to uh, Mr. James Benbridge. Benbridge. Yes, yeah. and um, I just caught the last of it um, this afternoon. And mm. you you started towards the end, started talking about mm. morality. And um, James, a couple of times, said, well, I don't pretend to have any particular, um, yeah. you know, yeah interest in morality or, or holding myself up to be particularly moral or anything else mm. i don't want to mis mm. misquote it but i think that's kind of where he was going he didn't yeah. have an interest yeah. in he was in expressing a, a more libertarian view. bent these days yeah. yes so yeah and i got the impression from your hesitance that you, mm. which you've just said um that yeah, yeah you had a different view um yeah. I don't know, maybe are, are you how old, mm. how much older than James are you, are you? If you don't mind me asking. Well, I think James is thirty, and I'm I'm forty nine. I'm just I'm just about to turn fifty. So, so you're closer to me than to James, and perhaps as you yeah. get a little bit older, yeah. and I don't know, maybe it's an age thing, or maybe it's just a personality or a character thing. I don't I, know. But. It's, it's all of these, isn't it? You know, it's, I mean, I'm sure you, like me, have just looked at, um, you know, w when you've got like say a decent chunk of time under your belt to look back on parts of your life, and about you know fifteen to twenty years is a kind of good period. Um, although lots of these things perhaps occur to you earlier as well. But, you know, you look back and you can see the changes that have un happened over various electoral cycles and various economic up and ups and downs. And you begin to sort of take a kind of snapshot of the country around you the, or the people around you or your own life in the context of that. And you begin to see that, you know, I don't think everything is great. I don't think everything is kind of working. I don't I mm. see I see and I feel so much unhappiness out there. Yeah. Not just my own. I mean, I've got plenty of unhappiness to go around <laughs> if people want some. But I, 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 I as an adult, I, I see it much more now. Like I said, you know, when you're young and an actor and you're ambitious and you're trying to go, 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 go and, and forge a career. And like all young people, they're trying to do that and to sort of, you know, respond to natural instincts to try and pair bond, form families and, and, and get jobs and stuff. But when you're older and you've kind of, you know, you've probably messed up a few chances anyway. Um and you also begin to look at things perhaps with an eye of, I guess my mother would say, you know, you be become a bit more compassionate mm. and you start to read other people's circumstances and you don't necessarily want to outcompete them and crush them out of your way. You know, you begin to look at other people and yeah, you get a real sense of feeling for what they're going through and the lives they've had and the progress they've made in that time. And and you look at your own life in comparison, you get a sense as you know, I say a lot of people who, as you say, there's there's people who are doing all right, you know. I'm okay, Jack. Pull the ladder up. Don't don't mind me. I'll just you know carry on. 
and and as I say, the increasing number of people who are very, very, very alienated from the society that they're in, whether it's to do with, you know, the rapid demographic change in areas of the country because of, you know, hyper mass migration. I mean, at a level that's, you know, sort of roughly, I don't know what, you know, 10 to 20 times the average of what it would have been in the past. Um, well, and, and, and the visible change the in communities. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, I, 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 I don't know what it is at the moment, but it was sort of three to five hundred thousand people net. I think it's running just about five hundred thousand. It may have been, I think, six hundred thousand in the last year or two. Yeah, but How I mean, I think it was an that? average of about thirty thousand, twenty-five thousand back in the nineties. Yeah, no. I mean, this is the, and of course, and I think it is changing because certainly, and of course, it may just be me, but mm. um, uh, I certainly now don't. I there was a time when they had managed to govern speech and the Overton window was such that mm. if you were to say uh, if you were to even mention immigration um, mm. you were a racist that was it straight mm. away whereas now frankly somebody if I start mm. talking about immigration and somebody calls me a racist I just tell them to sod off uh, mm. because I think it has lost a lot of its power because people know mm. they're talking rubbish it's just a, it's a tool to yeah uh, to, to shut you up um, yeah yeah yeah, and you yeah. can you can have a sensible conversation about immigration, and you can say I had this on Twitter the other day. I, I'm not sure it was a sensible conversation on Twitter, but I had the conversation <laughs> on Twitter along the lines of somebody had basically said that you know, oh yeah, some um, of course they can do it. So I think you know it was oh some gammon, some old gammon, or something. Yeah. It might actually have been yeah. that some um, little spat that you had with your little American friends. I might have chipped in on the side of that. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, yeah, and it was. Um, well, first of all, frankly, I don't give a stuff what you um, what you say because I yeah. you're not coming from a point of you you're, you have no goodwill. There's, there's nothing there other than trying to close down the debate. But secondly, mm. um, yes, twenty thousand, thirty thousand, mm. even fifty thousand people, mm. um, give or take, mm. some years, and then maybe a hundred thousand people one year, and then uh, and and. Uh, maybe you don't have any of the next year when yeah. a functioning economy ought to be able to have immigration uh, and immigration mm. but what mm. you can't have is mm. um, two cities the size of uh, no. Southampton coming in every year especially yeah. when they're coming in from parts of the world where um, they either don't speak the language or they mm. don't believe the same basic things that we believe yeah. uh, and even though they may well be perfectly, the majority of them, the vast majority of them might be perfectly decent people. Mm. They might be more moral in many ways. You know, if they're mm. very religious, mm. for example, they, mm. they may, you might yeah. look at their morality and go, well, yeah. you know, there are certain things about them that you can see why they despise the West or what they think is the West. Um, yes. But then they come and live here. Um, they don't assimilate. Yes. And you end up um, with a them and us in your own nation. And as you say, a nation yes. was a very nice package. You had a nation of people. Mm. You you traded with other nations. You respected mm. other other nations' culture. You respected their um, the way they did things. Uh, you went and visited them and experienced their culture. And then mm. you came home to your culture. And now yes. our culture is big. You don't see Saudi Arabia um, with half the cabinet <laughs> coming from North Yorkshire or or um, the, the, you know, Hampshire <laughs> yeah. or whatever. Do you? South Wales. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that yes, just doesn't yeah. happen. It's only happening yeah. in the uh, in the West in the Anglosphere. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's it's. The, I mean, again, it's one of the problems of the kind of liberal paradigm that people tend to hyper individualize everything and every phenomenon and every experience. So they look at them through the eyes of themselves as individuals relating to other individuals. But this is, uh, I mean, this is an idea I've used before. The 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 uh, the uh, the guy Edward Bernays, who's who's featured in the Adam Curtis documentary, The Century of the Self, was the guy who invented PR and you know right. effectively corporate propaganda. You know, and one of the things that I always struck with stuck with me about him was that his daughter was saying he didn't think about people in terms of individuals. He thought about people in terms of hundreds of thousands and of millions. So it's it's always about judging the aggregate effect of these things rather than going, oh, you know, Mr. Patel, who runs the corner shop, should he be here in this country? You know, it's not that kind of a moral questioning about, oh, yeah, my mate Abdul, who, who lives down the road, I get on with him. You know, should he be here? It's not the sort of a question about relating your in, individual degree of xenophobia, if such you have, um, to the people you know. It's about saying, as you say, 
well, we're, we're, you know, we're bringing in, um, you know, uh, here 100,000 people from this part of, uh, you know, um, sub-Saharan Africa or from the Middle East. And as you say, we're creating a balkanized community within a country. Now, it's not the individual people necessarily within themselves as individuals that are the problem. But when you create the aggregate cultural transfer, you create a, a discontinuity in the society. You know, you are, you are, you know, you, you're dealing with numbers that are not assimilable. Uh, to the extent that it may have been in the past and and as such you are you know you are provoking community ructions you are provoking um you know cultural discontinuities and anxieties in the people who are the people who were there before so yeah. to speak you know the the c- continuous population groups that have been at least you know propagating and consolidating for the last thousand years since the norman invasion so it's it's a difficult thing you're not it's when people personalize it and talk in terms of personal xenophobia i think that it gets bogged down because actually it's about saying look it's you you're changing the quantities of one thing that you're putting into another vessel and a vessel only has so much capacity and and like a country like ours i mean people can blithely say oh we've got so much capacity we've got so much space we've got all this money but the actual way we live in our aggregated towns and villages and cities um the capacity isn't there it's not we can't just you know build an extra number of hospitals or towns just like that so we're having to compress people into these um you know modes of living which uh, don't have the arithmetic volume capacity to be able to tolerate that and as a result there's this human sort of fraying at the edges uh, and and that has to be attended to in some way because it impacts on the, the quality of life of the people in that nation and and so you have you have to kind of reassess um you know how you how you consider that nation to be do you consider it to be something that's uh you know a heritable property of people who were there for a continuous period of time of a certain ethnic grouping uh, or do you just say it's it's kind of like a you know it's like a holiday park it's a theme a theme park or something it's 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 like a commercial space where you just simply put more labor in and it kind of all homogenizes into you know a, a big sort of factory zone uh, where there's uh, plenty of people earning you know little little to no um, you know uh, you know decent money and uh, you know working in low skilled jobs. Well, that's exactly. I mean, that's basically this whole capitalism thing and from we, we've gone from being a society and of course mm. there was that there's no such thing as society which was attributed to margaret thatcher although i think misattributed in that she said it but i think even at the time it was clear that she to me as a, a relatively young man at the time or maybe even a teenager probably yeah. it was um I didn't read from what she said that she meant there's yeah. no such thing as a society. I think society. The, mis- yeah, the, mis- the misinterpretation is that people say, oh, she's saying that there's no kind of, um, you know, community warmth that applies. You know, yeah. she what she was trying to say was, look, um, you know, people things only happen because people do things as individual people you know yes. you can't take a bunch of people and say you are society and i can blame you for this because all of these people have had different histories different acts within their histories different levels of agency and you can't hold people collectively responsible you can't sort of you know um go to people you know uh, you know in york and say you know well you're all responsible for the slave trade you know yeah. <laughs> you've, all, you've all got to deal with this now it's your your society and you have to bear the brunt of, of this kind of moral fracture in our history and i think that's it's 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 unrealistic it's stupid it's unfair it doesn't make sense so there's no society in that sense of abstraction but there are individual people living in a place living in a time and of course these are complex relationships but again the the, the proposal in a sort of increasingly collectivized kind of form of of, of left-wing politics is such that you can take groups of people and and some groups of people are bad and some are some are hard done by and you can then sort of redress the sort of justice balance between them by taking from one group and giving to another well it's it's trading on grievances as well as that it's making a victim telling them they're a victim and then using that grievance uh to um enact what you want which is you know effectively revolution or whatever um re re molding uh society in the in this new sort of um Mm. nirvana Uh, i think um as well it's interesting that and I mean, this is a bit of a trope now, but the fact that the mm. the left are almost without doubt, in a, in a, if you start a conversation, it's nearly always, if there's going to be a racist there somewhere, it's going to be the mm. left, because mm. they classify everybody by um, 
skin color or whatever else what i find is quite interesting um and i don't think that i think this is done because they just don't get it i think they are not all of them obviously but you know are racist is that um if, you know one of the protected characteristics if you like well literally legally a protected characteristic is somebody a racial minority so if mm. you happen to have brown skin for example so yeah. the left then classify everybody with brown skin as being the mm. same so whether you come from yeah. afghanistan or somalia yeah. or pakistan or bangladesh or india yeah. Yeah, you're a little brown person, so you're you, yeah. you know, you're a good guy, and we will have yeah. lots of you because we want to uh, and, really and you, rub you in, the right face in it. As yeah, you inherit person. a set of grievances as well. Exactly. You know, but but, uh, but the problem is, then you, and and they're getting this now in a lot of um, um, in in France and in um, different parts of Europe where they they're mm. housing um, immigrants from all over the North Africa and the Middle East and uh, the Indian subcontinent, and they have they've got gangs of different. Um, racial groups mm. fighting each other because yeah. it turns out the Somalis don't get on awfully well with the I don't know the Bangladeshis Afghans. or the Afghans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we're now looking at tens of thousands of Afghans coming, which is perhaps something we could touch on. But I mean, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, you look at what's happening out there at the moment. Which mm. actually, I've, I've got a little bit of a theory. I did tweet it yesterday briefly. Um, mm. Am I being too cynical to think? that Biden, who I think doesn't know what day it is, but the people no. behind Biden, the neocons, which that's who's behind Biden, is it? it's got to be yeah, the neocons, yeah. um, mm -hmm. that what could they achieve out of this? They've, I don't believe anybody is as, inc um, as, uh, as unable to, to just do the basics as, as Biden's administration has been. So mm. you, you take, you, you're working to a time frame. You set the time frame for 9-11, as I understand it. Well, um, something was mm. for 9-11, but it was the um, mm. 11th September. But I know it's the, th the end of August, isn't it, is the actual mm. date. Um, mm. uh, you withdraw, you leave it until the last minute. You withdraw all of your troops, mm -hmm. leave all of the um, the administrators and yeah. all the normal people that, you know, in, in the country. Mm -hmm. Don't even tell um, the Afghan army or your British and European... Mm allies what you're doing mm. disappear the place mm -hmm. falls into absolute carnage mm -hmm. the press do the what the press do mm -hmm. um and i read a couple of people today saying well we might have to go back in and <laughs> um and um and make sure we get all these people out and if they start yeah. killing people then we're going to have to go in and show them who's boss mm. and you go well isn't that convenient because for 18 months mm. we haven't had any killings of us or i don't think of british servicemen yeah, um, because we were going to be leaving. You know, Trump had sort of sourced that we were going to be leaving. So the mm. Taliban are going right. Okay, well we'll just keep quiet and we'll be, we'll be in the pan seats and what have you. And then um, all of a sudden, that's all fallen apart. Mm. You suddenly start getting videos of um, of people getting murdered and shot and tortured and imprisoned and whatever else is going to happen. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, well, the only way out of this is to go back in and restart a war which had all but finished. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I may be being totally cynical about it, but I just it mm. just occurred to me the other day, and I thought, well, yeah. you know, yeah. who benefits? You've, you've given a of... you've given a booster shot to the moral justification uh, for being in the country, haven't you? You yeah. know, you had the original, uh, you know, the original vaccination against terrorism. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where's this analogy going to go? <laughs> um, and then, you know, twenty years later, you know, you've created a, a you know a, a bit of a you know bit of a bad night in Baghdad to bring an old war into the uh, metaphor there, yep. probably yep. Uh, inadvisedly. And um, now you've got, as you say, it's 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 going to end up in all sorts of nastiness, all sorts of atrocities, and there's going to be you know cries to go in on a humanitarian basis to go and pull pull them apart again. And and again, it's going to give that 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 uh, booster shot to the whole project of being there to partake in what you know people have been calling the forever wars in the Middle East uh, yet again. And of course, you know. Um, you know uh, where there's where there's war you can you can make money and um you know that's that's entirely <clears throat> entirely possible from the point of view of a system that like ours operates on a kind of principle of creative destruction forever and ever you know constantly wanting to upgrade the the cycles uh, and you know artifacts of consumption uh, and you know move people on to the 
the next thing and then the next thing and then the next thing. There's no kind of, you know, setting the thing right and then leaving it and walking away. You know, there's no sort of sense of, well, you know, uh, you know, as JFK said about Vietnam, you know, in the final analysis, it's their war. They're the ones who have to win it or lose it, yeah. you know. Um, and, you know, um, that shows how desperate I am quoting JFK, a Democrat, <laughs> you know, but you know, I think he's right. I think, you know, to be honest, you know, uh, our kind of um, Western interventionism um, for whatever reason, for the best of reasons, uh, it now strikes me as uh, extremely misguided and foolish and wrong and well, uh it's not that i don't grieve over these things that i see that are terrible and in the past i used to be very much about you know yeah go in there hit them hard sort them out unfortunately the people in charge don't have um the the you know i mean i i wouldn't have if i was going to invade those countries i wouldn't just sort of go in with a sort of minimal military force and try and sort it out i'd invade them i'd conquer yeah, them yeah. And then I'd go in and take everybody's guns off every, you know, yeah. off, off, you know, and you would subdue them into a society that, you know, would then be under an imperial rule. But would that be a great thing to do in the long run for the Afghans? It occurs to me, as I say, as I get older, why not just leave them to run their society the way they want? And if it's going to be a very savage and cruel uh, and, uh, you know, offensive society to us, well, perhaps that's just the lesson of life that. Yeah. Different peoples live at different speeds, and I'm afraid there's people who are going to live lives and societies that we're going to find extremely hard to deal with, extremely objectionable, extremely frightening, extremely vulgar, extremely horrifying, and we just have to leave them to do it, and it's terrible, but I don't think we can go in with a sense of, you know, um, you know shooting them into democracy. Um, because it's not something that they want. They 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 are very old, conservative, very reactionary societies. Now it just happens that the form of conservative reaction that we have in England, um, you know, over the last thousand years, and you know, that since that feudal period is one that's a bit more livable. You know, we don't have to constantly chop bits off people or execute people. We can kind of get by without a lot of that, um, and it's more agreeable as a reactionary society. But that's that's what they have. And they're it, exactly. just acting it out in and a certain I, way. I, I mean, it's. I, I had this argument again on, on Twitter the other day with somebody um, from the left. And mm. they were arguing, we've got to go back in. And uh, and, and again, you know, you're racist. Mm. Because I was saying, why, why are we taking, you know, we okay. I was all for my view, which is probably, this, I think the majority of people probably think this in Britain. Those that have been on our side and have risked something for the mm. project that we introduced um, and forced upon Afghanistan, this sort mm. of westernizing of the of the country, those people that have taken a risk and have, have, have sided with us, they're effectively, if that was happening in Britain, mm. um, they have been collaborators. Yeah. Um, so it would be reasonable to take them... Um, you know bring them away and say right well you're you know you you risk something we asked mm. you to and you did it it's only mm. fair that we should bring you to this country mm. uh, at least in the short term i haven't mm. really got a problem with that i think that's reasonable mm. i don't think mm. we should have been there in the first place or at least mm. we should have gone there we should mm. have um we should have done what we were going to do which was to um yeah. chastise the taliban destroy their ability to have training mm. camps Get yeah. Al Qaeda and get, um, which obviously in the end he was in Pakistan anyway. Get um, uh, you know, the main man, and then mm. and then get out. That's what we should have done. But then we decided to mm. nation build and all this sort of rubbish. Well, nation building. And I was having this argument with the, these lefties, and mm. they were all for it. Nation, you know, we should have women's rights. We should have this. We should have that. So you're colonialist then. Mm. You're arguing for yeah. colonialism. Yeah. Um, in yeah. fact, you're arguing for worse than colonialism because at least the East India Company still traded with the middle class and the upper class of yeah. India, and we had a trading relationship with them, and we married into their society. Yeah. Um, you know, we had officers there that were going out there and marrying into the into the high levels, high echelons of India, and it was probably, uh, okay, there was some pretty horrendous things happened, but as invasions of an entire continent go, or subcontinent, mm. it was pretty good really i think you know we did it with trade didn't we initially mm -hmm. and then and then as i i'm no great historian but then as i understand it the british um bureaucracy took over from the east india company or whatever or, um mm -hmm. and and then you ended up getting we tried to impose the very things which we're now trying to do in afghanistan um, mm -hmm. that's my understanding of it and and i mm -hmm. it seems nuts I'm, I'm very much with you i think let mm -hmm. them do what they're going to do 
Yeah. Frankly, I don't even agree with half the things that um, modern West want the modern Western society to be. So why yeah. we should impose it on Afghanistan, I have no idea. Um, and, yeah. It's, yeah. it's it's madness. And, um, and it just it just may be that, I mean, there may be terrible things that happen. People may die. They may If we left them entirely alone. But it may be that the aggregate casualty body count may be less than if we go in and start, you know, <laughs> you know, hurling high velocity rounds around the place yeah. and uh, bunker buster bombs and, uh, you know, all of the sort of uh, lovely toys that we have. Um, it just may be that, yes, there'll be there'll be some carnage. It might just be a lot less than the carnage that we bring when we go into these places, because, as you say, the only way we can go in and deal with this sort of stuff is, as I said, if we'd sent in overwhelming military force, got all of these guys who identified with the Taliban and slaughtered them, yeah. you know. We just take absolutely everybody out, you know. Um, and I think people think that's kind of what we can do in the West or the way our politicians work, you know, because we see it in in small cases. We see our very capable soldiers, you know, doing all sorts of ma amazing things, you know. But people think it's like, you know, you send the SAS in, you kill everyone in the place. And then, you know, in the old words from uh, from from Tacitus, you create a desert and you call it peace, you know. <laughs> And and that's that's the problem. You know, that's kind of the only way to do it. You you have a kind of Roman kind of conquest. You you kill everyone. You you know, you take the women and children as slaves. All the men go. You burn the place to the ground and you salt the earth. It's a you know, and that's the nature of that kind of conquest and war. It's not yeah. nice. It's not going to be so it wouldn't it be better perhaps just to back off, <laughs> let people live uh, and, 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 you know, forego all the carnage and, um, you know, deal with it from afar don't look to intervene let it change at its own pace it, it may be savage you know but it's uh it's perhaps better than us losing lives us spending loads of money us creating these complicated problems and as you say then we've got the situation where we've got these moral uh, debts to pay and it means bringing people into our country and further uh aggravating our own social cohesion problems and our ability to assimilate people from, you know, countries that perhaps we shouldn't have been in the first place. It was always a kind of circular, paradoxical thing. And it, it you just kind of want to cut the Gordian knot and say, look, just stop going into countries. Just well, exactly. know, well, have commercial haven't we, relationships. Haven't we just told three million Hong Kongers they can come here as well? Of course, yeah. I mean, yeah. so if, if, say, a half of them come here, that's one and a half million Hong Kongers. Now, you might say, well, actually, they are, they are um, probably they probably think a lot more like we do. Um, sure. And yeah. um, they're probably very um, largely entrepreneurial as a group. Um, yeah. They value freedom because they've been yeah, yeah. losing it. They have also been brought up largely in a British colonial um, yeah. background, backdrop. Yeah. So you could say, well, actually, there's a lot to be said for bringing them in. I'm sure there would be a lot of very yeah. capable and, um, and, and wealth as well that would come in if, if China lets it go. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, but yeah. if you've got one and a half million Hong Kongers... Yeah. And you've got our existing population of yeah. um, Indians, Pakistanis, Caribbean, um, and yeah. North Africans, and what have you. And then yeah. on top of that, you bring in, um, I don't know, 100,000 Afghanis or something, and their families. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where does everybody go? Where do they all go to school? Um, yes. What yes. happens to the NHS? We can't even, I can't get a doctor's appointment now. So, I mean, what's yeah, going to happen? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that's the thing. That's where you sort of begin to ask, you know, what is the, what is the the demographic situation in any given country? You know, it's and 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 you get into all kinds of you know tricky areas in in social media terms and in political consciousness terms, where you know you look into the areas of uh, ethno nationalism and you look at the 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 contesting sort of model of civic nationalism yeah. and the the idea that we can relate people to nation based on either their you know their their genetic inheritance their lineage their provenance or we can relate it on the basis of abstract values um and and these come from a kind of liberal prospectus and that the problem i think increasingly is that people are seeing that the liberal prospectus doesn't work because anybody can say they have these values and come and live in the country and then they can kind of revert you know regress to the mean and adopt their native cultural values from their country yeah. and 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 then we kind of then do this sort of rearguard action of saying okay well we're going to allow you to preserve your 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 imported culture now because we're very liberal about this and and you can practice as it were 
you know, <laughs> so you, you, we actually, we're actually ingesting a little part of another country into our own and saying, well, it's all cool. You know, you can kind of form your own little sort of, um, you know, ethnic fiefdoms and, uh, you know, just, just sort of largely behave as you want, really. There's no kind of, um, you know, control of that. You know, we, we can't, we don't have the numbers to police it or to, uh, you know, to regulate it. So, you know, you just carry on. And then you begin to see this happening more and more and you think, well, there, there is a problem here. You can't, you can't just, um, you know, outsource it all to this kind of notion of these abstract values. You have to say, well, values tend to be particular. They tend to be rooted in place and culture and tradition. And, I mean, dare I say it, you know, the ethnic composition of the country uh, creates and binds a lot of those things together and makes for a kind of homogeneous and more or less peaceable kind of social arrangement. And when it gets to a point where you begin to, um, uh, you know, in, in create incursions on that by breaking up the population into these these much more definable balkanized groups, you uh, headed on a path which inevitably induces conflict at some level. Once certain groups become bigger tribes, and and bigger tribes contest against other tribes, exactly. And you 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 know you go down the route that we've seen in so many countries in like in Africa where colonial powers have gone in. Um, they've instantiated, say, a minority tribe, as I think happened in Rwanda, uh, as the, the you know the elite, and the majority tribe as the kind of uh, you know, a proletarian bulk of the population, and of course, you know, you saw what happened there. Mm. Um, people are not happy, and I think we're just being tremendously naive that, um, you know, what they call magic soil theory. This this idea that's been alluded to, you know, in Douglas Murray's book, that people just pass through the borders of Europe or England and they just become English yeah. or they become European, and it's patent kind of nonsense. I, I don't um, think it can be. I don't think it's naive. I, I I'm afraid I'm of the view that so much of what's happening now can't be mm. just through naivety or incompetence. I think there has to be a guiding hand behind it. I just, um, mm. I mean, I'm not necessarily going down the route of, um, although I, I have some, um, I have some time mm. for it, but this whole um, Kalergi plan thing, which just jumps around from, all, from time to time. And well, whether it's conspiracy or not, it doesn't matter at the moment, because the way that those, the, the thing is that the, the, the capitalist system has, ingested these things as a matter of economic principle you know these things are just these things are happening transmigration of peoples across borders to to satisfy the needs of corporations has just happened it's, it doesn't matter about whether it's the kudenhof kalergi plan or not the, the the outcome has been that there's been vast migrations of people in a way that there's never been in history before um, on the basis of fulfilling economic indices. Well, this is something that, um, not on this particular topic, but this is something that James Dellingpole has said on mm. with regard to the whole COVID thing. Um, yeah. In that, you know, too many people are looking at it and going, but why would they want to do this? Why would they want mm. to do that? And, and yes, as you say, the reality is it doesn't really matter. It's like, it's mm. like saying, why did Hitler want to invade Poland? Or why did Hitler want to invade, you know, mm. when it's happening, it's happening. You, you know, you, yeah. you have to deal with it. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, it's, I don't know, there's so many things that we could talk about. I, I'm conscious we're now at one i I'm going to try and keep <laughs> it under two hours. So okay. um, mm. we, we, we were talking about what you're now doing, because uh, this mm. was originally about Simon Roberts. So you <laughs> you are doing your, um, the, you, I knew through the Dellingpod thing. You still, yep. I think, um, you know, a, a sort of a, 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 the Third Wednesday thing. You want to tell us a little bit about Third Wednesday for those? Yeah, Third Wednesday is something that Dick Dellingpole started um, in uh, Worcester. Um, he would go. Uh, he was a reenactor. He is a reenactor. Uh, he uh, recreates historical French soldiers from uh, the Napoleonic period, the First World War, and the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did a little bit of reenacting it myself in uh, in the past as well. Um, and I. Um, you know, Dick um, started, he, they have a, reg a regular Wednesday meetup for all the reenactors in Worcester. And he was just getting a bit bored with that. And he decided to start his own kind of meetups where it was his friends off Twitter. And right. uh, people would meet in real life in the pub on a Wednesday, just have drinks and get to know each other. And, um, you know, it, it, it's it's uh, it's been a thing that's been going, I don't know, since what, 2019 now. And uh, we've, um, you know, tried to keep it going. Um, I think also it was it was from an experience that we had when um, we had the uh, Delling pod um, down at Podcast Live in London, um, which may have been 2019 as well, where we went and did the, the Delling pod and then um, with Brendan O'Neill. And then we went to the pub with him afterwards. And we just thought, wouldn't it be nice to have this kind of thing where you meet these interesting people and you can talk politics and culture? Uh, and I think that was possibly a bit of an inspiration for it as well. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, that's continued apace, and that's something that we're trying to sort of spread, you know, the evangel of uh, throughout throughout the country, um, so that people, you know, move out of their social media uh, persona and, and context and go and, you know, find friends in real life, you know, with that as a springboard. And um, we've obviously started the one in in, in Worcester. Uh, you know, one has started in London. Uh, one is now in St. Albans. There's also one in Hertfordshire, which started last week. There's going to be the third Wednesday North, which is in Cheshire near Manchester. Mm-hmm. And um, the hope is that we can just, you know, see the creation of different nodes around the country where people meet up. And, you know, the the, the, the meets and the conversations are not necessarily about politics and culture, but that might be the sort of stuff that exercises people and they want to meet people of a similar kind of mind. And it tends to be people of a kind of, you know, conservative or libertarian or liberal bent. Um, and, and there are some people who are left wing as well. You know, I don't know where they are, but they are there, apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, and they come along, just have a drink in the pub on a Wednesday night, have great sort of banter and, and you know, and that and that's it and you do it once a month and it's kind of something to look forward to and it gives you i think that important sense of connecting with your community again now it may not be the community in the place you live because a lot of people i say this a lot you know london raid is going to be pricking up his ears they say they live atomized lives you know we tend to live outside the networks of families and communities in the way that perhaps we once did Mm -hmm. and we have to recreate senses of community through going out and meeting people and getting to know them and bonding with them and becoming friends and doing stuff together and uh you know you know you know annexing that human part of ourselves which had kind of you know fallen into disrepair because of the you know somewhat commercialized and insular you know consumption based lifestyles that we've had we've you know we've kind of a lot of people have lost the art of conversation they've become you know somewhat socially retired and uh you know perhaps also a bit anxious and afraid mm. of you know socializing and you know i was a i was i was a shy shy kid i was chronically shy as a kid and uh i just saw that in the end the people who were living in much better socialized families did better in life in general you know and uh that's why i i push people to like do things like this you know to communicate with other people even if it's just you know broadcasting at people but then you know maybe we go to the pub and we meet and do stuff i think it's healthy i think it's something that we've forgotten about the importance of you know human contact you know camaraderie enjoyment laughter and then who knows people develop all kinds of relationships out of that and I think that's one of the things that keeps a society strong. Yes. You know, this is going back to my sort of conservative beliefs that one of the weaknesses is that we've decided we can kind of do without people. You know, we can just download happiness off Amazon. You know, we can just, uh, you know, buy it in from, uh, you know, um, <laughs> what's that? What's that company that sends meals to your door? You know, Deliveroo. Uh, Deliveroo. You know, yeah. You, you know, we've 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 decided that we can simply bring these things to ourselves and consume ourselves into a pacified state instead of reaching out and integrating with other people and i think um as i say as a shy person uh i was very acutely aware of it that i was really under socialized i learned the facility and skill to socialize myself later and i realized if only i'd had this earlier my life could have turned out differently and i might have made better choices (laughs) and i might have who knows i might have been that actor i wanted to be now um if if i'd had that exposure to people in a in a positive way and i think a lot of people's exposure to other people is very negative uh in the lives that we've been living i I think you're right in this sort of yeah a a cubicle style uh, well actually in 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 offices that's that's a case in point you know that everyone's in their little cubicle but and of course now you're not even in a cubicle in an office you're but potentially you know at home in in your kitchen or, or in your spare room and yeah that again i wonder whether that isn't I, i'm not sure that that's entirely an accident but over the last 18 months certainly people have largely not everybody of course but um large swathes have become insular i think for that reason and so mm. in the same way they have the um stand in the park on a on a sunday at 10 o'clock yeah um uh, which i i haven't done yet but i think is a great idea obviously based around the lockdown to some extent yeah and and you could say it's a little bit out of date at the moment. But I frankly don't think. I think we go. We're, we're going to have another lockdown. I think in September, mm-hmm. October. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I think that stand in the park would be a really good thing. Go to your local park at ten a.m. Meet up with like-minded people and just, ha- if nothing else, because of lockdowns being the way they are, it at least gives you an opportunity to 
because not everybody is like-minded in families. That's one of the big tragedies, isn't it? Um, mm. I've got plenty of... Fa- uh, well, not family, actually. My family are all... I've got a very small family anyway, and they're all of, the, of one view, give or take. But um, lots of my friends don't feel the same way I do. Um, yeah. And it's been quite a problem for a lot of people, I think, in China, yeah. because it's such a big thing, isn't it? But um, yeah. I wanted to ask you a question, actually, because... Uh, so, yeah. so third Wednesday, how, mm. would, how would people... Before I ask you this question, how yeah. would people... Um, would they contact Dick, yeah. or would they, is there a website, or would they yeah. contact you, or how there, would it work? There is a website, the, the the name of which I've conveniently forgotten. It's probably something like thirdwednesday.co.uk, or right. Libertarian Drinks was another thing that we called it. I, 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 I'm not sure we should have attached ourselves to the name Libertarian, because it seems very specific. It, I think it's a general sentiment of, of being, you know, liberty-inclined yep. rather than libertarians. But, um, you know, yeah, it could be thirdwednesday.co.uk, or Libertarian Drinks, I'm not sure. There there is a website but i say the main thing is to go on twitter set yourself up a twitter account even just a holding account and follow dick Tellingpole because a lot of the third wednesday is advertised through him or yeah. me mm-hmm. on my twitter feed uh and and people like ronan ma up in third wednesday north uh people like zero to hero down in hertfordshire um milton free speech in st albans um there's also true beer badger who's doing it in london and various people who, at, when the time of the month comes, we put a shout out for the third Wednesdays and, you know, amplify everybody else's shout out so we can see the sort of meetings, you know, have some sort of continuity and growth. And that's the way to do it. If, but if all else fails, contact either Dick Dellingpole or myself and I'll be happy to, you know, put you in touch with whoever's doing it in a local part of the country. And if it's a question of not having a third Wednesday in your part of the country, start one. You know, I mean, a lot of people sort of tweet at Dick saying, oh, when are you going to come to our area of the country? And I think they're missing the point. It's kind of not going to happen that way. It's that you need to start your own. And I mean, hopefully in the future, I would love to persuade the Delling Poles to come round to the various different meets in all over, all over the country, mm. you know, when when the leisure and the money allows and come and, you know, sprinkle a bit of magic Delling Pole dust on it because they are, you know, fantastic people, great characters, and they do add an awful lot to the to the sentiment and the enjoyment of what we're trying to do with it. It's just to go to the pub and meet your new group of friends and to, uh, you know, have some real human contact in a, in a, in a positive way and that, that you can make things come out of that and you can cluster and build and, uh, you know, create those uh, community connections that you may have been lacking through alienation from your friends and your family or even just your local area where you, you don't meet people who agree with you. Mm. It's worth traveling to one of these Third Wednesday meetings, wherever it might be. I mean, I travel to Worcester, which is, you know, it's a good hour and a, hour and a quarter away to go to the, to the meeting there. Um, but it's well worth it just for my quality of life every month. You know, um, I traveled to the one in, um, third Wednesday North in Cheshire, uh, last week. Um, I'm going to go down to the one in Hertfordshire. There's the one in London and the one in St. Albans and just go and see everybody and, you know, keep, keep spirits up and, and keep pushing and propagating the idea. Well, I, I plan to do the same. I haven't been doing any yet, although I've been threatening to before the lockdown, I was going to go and then lockdown happened. And so, um, um, didn't push it then and then um, I wanted to go I think probably November is going to be my first one and that'll be great uh, Worcester because that's my little Worcester one. I should be there as well probably so, yeah. perfect so we'll do that and and yeah. I know that London Raider wanted to try to get together as well so he might well yeah. come up um, he's going to come down in September I think and we're going to meet up there's a there's a there's a pub that we go to in Ledbury uh, which is called uh, The Barn mm-hmm uh, in Ledbury, just off the high street. Very nice little place, very friendly. I mean, we, it's about picking places that are going to, you know, not have all the mask and distancing bullshit, you know, people who are not bedwetters. Pubs where, you know, like the uh, the Railway Inn in Mobley in Cheshire, in, mm-hmm. in Nutsford, where the, the landlord is completely solid on all this stuff and they're like, nope, we're going back to normal, normal drinks, normal pub, normal life, and insist insist upon that. Yep. in order to, to make this work and to um, show them that um, we, we simply don't accept this so-called new normal. We are wanting the one. We want to, uh, we want to resume the old normal. Yeah. Normal normal is what we the want. The normal normal. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, um, and the, uh, the question I had for you, which was um, just an aside, but mm. uh, and you may well say, no, it wasn't me. Um, mm. in, and you might not even remember this far back to uh, what you were doing, but around mm. Christ- just before Christmas 2019, mm. so before all this madness started, Mm. I think it was a Friday or a Saturday night. I was in a little pub in Worcester. Mm. Um, and I've forgotten the name of the pub. You've probably been in it if you've uh, seen Dick up there. Yeah. It's quite a small 
homely pub with a bar and a saloon yeah. um, near the railway arches and what have you, uh, near, yeah. down towards the, the race course, I think, um, yeah. from Fourgate Street. And yeah. um, I was in there, Dick was in there, and obviously I recognised him because he's very recognisable. And as I was a yeah. fan of the show and had seen him talking to... Um, to his bro on several occasions so um i was quite a fan so i went over and introduced myself and yeah. uh, said i'm a big fan um just wanted to say hi and keep up the good work and um he yeah. was very gracious and just said oh you know you know thanks for coming over anyway and i i wandered off thinking i made a bit of a tit of myself but um oh, no. he was with somebody and the, the more i think yeah. about it the more i wondered yeah. whether it was you could it be was it a pub with lots of wooden beams in and stuff is it kind of quite oldy an oldie an, an old boozer an old sort of um, it, it has a quite a sort of smallish sort of um, like tap room, almost a bit like yeah. a sort of medieval barn. Yes. Um, yeah. I'd t- it was if you come from Fourgate Street, walk down towards one of the side roads down by where there's some railway arches. So if you walk yeah. that way, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's down on the right, I think. And there's um, it was a nice, yeah. just felt like a comfortable old style pub. Was it quite empty at the time? Do you remember? Um, well, we were standing at the. I was standing at the bar with my brother and a friend, and then um, yeah. you. Well, Dick was sat down at a table with one other person. That would have uh, been me, probably. Yeah, right. that sounds like we. I did have a night that I went out with uh, Dick. Yeah, to the pub, and um, we were having a chat about some stuff that had come up. Um, that I was telling him about the alt right, <laughs> and I thought it was important <laughs> to have a, have a word in his ear. Um, because there was all this kind of stuff of um, groping going on and people attacking people's social media content to, uh, you know, discuss sort of alt-right talking points. And um, I I sort of had to go to see Dick and say, look, I've got to explain what's happening to you because this might affect James's stuff. Right. Um, and because uh, I was, as I say, I'm quite protective of what's happening in, in brand Delling Pole, as it mm. were. And there was always, there's always people wanting to take a kind of swipe at some level. And um, so I think that could have been it. Yeah, I went down. It was kind of winter. Sort yes, of period. It was just yeah, you know, just before Christmas, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I just occurred to me, you know, how you suddenly think about it, and I thought, mm-hmm. well, actually, that might well have been you, because I just, it, you know, but it's a while ago now, just yes. before all this madness started. But um, yes. So we may well have met. How about that? But um, there you go. Weird, isn't it? You know, <laughs> sliding doors. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, so we we in terms of other stuff you're doing, you um. Mm. Uh, Probably 100% of people are listening to this uh, mm. as and when it goes out um, mm. and, um, will already know of you and what you do. But sure. um, you obviously were doing the Guff stream with uh, Hector Drummond before yeah. uh, a couple of months ago. Um, yes. So that's on sort of hiatus at the moment, as I understand it. That may um, or may not come back, yes. Hector right. wanted to take some time out to do a bit more music and comedy stuff and, you know, work on other things. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, it's it's got potential to come back if, if people want it to and if he wants it to. Uh, it's his baby, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, we're more than happy to do it, I think. But, you know, he might want to have someone else on the show, do another kind of format altogether, you know, and, and I might be cast to the wayside. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to be bitter because I've, I've started something else. But again... Like I, I, when we originally talked, I encouraged you to do this. I encouraged, um, you know, Mike Livesley to do his show. Mm-hmm. Uh, just want to see, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, as uh, yes, as Mao Tong once said, and uh, <laughs> just keep it going. Just keep doing stuff because it can't hurt, and it prompts people to get together, listen around the radio, or listen around a YouTube stream, or go to the pub and meet some people. I mean, it just it just doesn't matter, you know. I don't care if, you know, people want to, you know you know play the trombone naked with one foot in the lavatory you know and put a video of it on youtube if it makes us laugh and it gets us together you know it's <laughs> just you know um it's something to do you know and it could be you could you know do cartoons like bob moran or you could do viral videos or something just mm. just you know put something in there and get us you know get us to pay attention get us around it and create sort of some sort of cultural momentum in a different direction from the one that you're kind of spoon fed by, you know, the BBC or, you know, Sky TV or even GB News and and find another way of making contact. Well, I think that's the point as well, isn't it? I mean, not only is it what harm comes of it, you get to meet. I mean, I've met some really um, uh, nice people through this and yeah. um, through your encouragement, because you did very much. You know, when I, I think one night I've just had enough and. I think I DM'd you and said, like, I'm just sick. I want to do something. I don't know what to do. And um, you were very um, kind and um, encouraged me. And, yeah, I just don't think it can do any harm. And it and it, it does get... There's one thing that's obvious, and that is that there's very little in the... There's nothing, really, in the mainstream that 
that does anything other than follow the, the standard narrative. Um, yeah. We, we could talk about it forever. I know you've already talked about it on another stream, which I've not yet listened mm. to, but the, the GBTV um, mm. thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's um, I, I probably best if people... What stream was that on that you were, you were on? That was the stream on Thomas Barden Reese's channel. Uh, and I had a chat with a guy called Nick Cotton who goes under the name of Unwashed. Uh, he's a kind of a dissident um, media provocateur mm -hmm. and, and Thomas is, is interested in conspiracy theory and dissident thought. And we had a chat about GB News, good or bad thing. You know, I mean, in general, a lot of people on, on the dissident uh, side of things, you know, and I'm probably overlapping with a bit of that, uh, just find that, you know, it's 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 a kind of um, it's a kind of way of making people feel a little bit better about the fact that they're not getting what they want out of the BBC or the other mainstream media. But it's still a kind of fairly heavily curated narrative to to keep people kind of you know fairly stultified i guess yeah, yeah. um you know a lot of people want i think a bit more advocacy um from the media they want to see the media taking a moral attack on certain issues and really you know articulating the kind of roar of of pain and frustration that a lot of people have because they're not getting it from their representative politicians and they're not getting it from their cultural organizations so there's a sort of sense of a a pressure building up that needs to be, you know, channeled in some direction, um, but creatively and usefully and perhaps effectively. And, you know, I decided to do it in a kind of DIY fashion. And yeah, there's not that necessarily many people listening to what I do or to, you know, you do or other people do, but it's a start. You won't get anywhere without it and you have to kind of keep pushing and pushing some people may decide to change their minds you know you you know you might go and do something completely different to to, to do it but it just is something that uh, as i say brings us uh, around the hearth again and um you know gets us to talk about what we what we really find important and interesting and um yeah so that was a, that channel and that chat is is still up um, well, I would and, definitely uh, recommend people go and, because I, I, will, I do want to listen to that and see what, because I think that was a primary topic, wasn't it, that you were going to talk about was the mm. was this side, side of things. Sorry, you were going to say something else? No, 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 that was it really. I was just going to waffle on, um, <laughs> which, the, I, do, which the, I do a lot. The other thing that I was going to say was that, um, I mean, I, I, on GB News, which I don't, yeah. I, don't have, I don't watch TV, but I do see the YouTube clips from time to time. Mm. Most of it, I've, I've made my mind up that I think most of it is... Yes, it's a placeholder. It's just there to try and yeah. pretend that there's an alternative to BBC. However, mm. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a great fan of um, Neil Oliver. I think from yeah. the, when, when you talk about morals, and I think he's really grasped something there. It, he's all about mm. um, the moral side of things, isn't he? Yes, it, yes. Uh, his monologues are, are very powerful. Um, so I'm a big fan of his. I follow him yes. on, on Twitter and also calvin uh, robinson calvin robinson he's had a fantastic yeah, he, week this week he seems to have doesn't he yeah i mean that was the thing that nick and i talked about that the uh, you know we had a kind of we played this sort of dellingpole yes no game you know <laughs> so we said like uh, tom harwood no you know uh, <laughs> becca hudson no and um there was a couple of names actually i mean um, dan wotton was somebody i had to little i had to have a little think about him because although i think he's still pretty posed in some ways as they say mm -hmm. um I think he's trying. He's trying. And 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 Calvin Robinson was another name where people said, well, you know, yeah, he's you kind of could take him for a kind of a bit of a liberal, bit of a classical liberal where, you know, there's some things he's not quite addressing. And I think there are some things he's not quite addressing. But at the same time, he has he has been pretty. I saw the clip of him talking about Tony Blair. That was absolutely and priceless. That was great body slam. You know, that was good. And that, more of that. And yes. as you say, Neil Oliver has a, a moral um, gravity and a kindness and a humour about him. And he has all of that, but he has um, he has the right amount. He is, I think, a perfect example of what um, Jordan Peterson's talking about when he says that you, you don't you don't want to be nice, but you mm. want to be you want to be competent, and you want to be capable of being dangerous. Yes, but but. Like, you know, it's like it's like to talk softly and carry a big stick. I get that yes. impression with Neil Oliver. He he's the yes. sort of guy that if you were talking to him and you went the wrong way, yes. he's not going to slap you because you talked to him. But if you were to do something that it was, you know, 
um, you know, pee in his rice bowl or or um, hurt somebody that he loved or something. You can imagine that he would be, um, you know, this is my imagination here. I'm not saying he's going to do it. But, you know, he would be a, somebody you would not want to cross. And I think that that yes. is, without um, having <laughs> setting the authorities on him, I think that what I'm yeah. trying to say is he is a competent and therefore a dangerous person who yeah. has a moral base to him. And yeah. I think that's what you want, really, isn't it? You want to have... It's, yeah. You don't want yeah. somebody who's just wishy-washy nice, doesn't want to upset anybody, um, yeah. doesn't have any boundaries. You want somebody yeah. who's going to be strong and have boundaries, but also be tolerant and also be reasonable, but, um, but you know, have a line. And I think that's what, yeah. what he has. Well, yeah. I mean, again, the, the part of me that's no longer liberal, sort of my, my eyebrows raise when you say tolerant, because I've decided that there are things I'm just not going to tolerate. I don't tolerate things. I, I, I say I don't like this. I object to this. Oh, I, I would say that, this. but I might tolerate the fact that it's there. Yeah. So, you know, I well, say, know, well, yeah, OK. I, I think you've summarized it well, though, because, I mean, the, the important thing about Neil Oliver, as I, as I said, maybe said to you before, you know, it's it's he's talking about very serious things that are happening you know and he's talking about it in an affecting way yes and and it, it's that important quality that you've identified that he is serious but not solemn yeah okay he doesn't need to be solemn but he, he's deadly serious you know he, he means what he says i think and he's talking about things which we should take seriously we don't need to be solemn we don't need to be po face we don't need to be ridiculous about it but we do need to go these are real issues. These are real problems. These are not things that will just go away by a kind of, uh, you know, wishy-washy liberal pretending them away kind of approach. We need to address them. And some of them are going to be questions that may induce conflict. And uh, if that's the case, so be it. Mm. You know, sometimes have to, you have to resolve things through some sort of approach which includes conflict. I'm not necessarily saying direct physical violent conflict, but I'm talking about the, the you know, the contention of people against each other and not the kind of soppy wet compromise thing that we do in England at the moment yeah. where we say well let's all just get along and it kind of just means getting along with people who frankly could be quite evil well and I think <laughs> you know, as well we can't uh, get along with evil James Dellenpole says this a lot and I've been agreeing with this for a very long time but I've been following yeah. him for for quite a, a couple of years at least I've, I'm low numbers on special friend badges although I've lost it but I think I was probably about number 16 or something so um, oh, um not from me so um so I have been a fan of his for, for a fair while but um what was I going to say yes he, he he is of that view I think that um uh and not just him but yeah, the the left are playing for keeps uh, totally. know, it's not even the left anymore, is it? It's it's something yeah. deeper than that. It's not just the left. It's it's a mm. it's a whole undercurrent of of mm. just everything that seems wrong. Or well, James would yeah. no doubt say satanic. I mean, he's sort of um, yeah. gone down that particular route. And I have Luciferian, some Luciferian. Yes. Yeah, I have some. I'm not really religious, but I, I um I do have some. I do think that more and more evil and and that sort of thing comes yeah. to my mind when I'm trying to describe something. It's just yeah. depraved, or it's it's just yeah. you know so wrong and wrong just for the sake of being wrong and to destroy. But they're playing for keeps these people, and totally. um, there's nobody, very few people on the right or um, on the opposite side of the coin that are. That are really even know that they're in a in a war. You know, the culture no, wars they, is yeah, new to they, most people now. It's been going on for years. I, Douglas yeah. Murray's been talking about it. I mean, he's been very quiet recently, but he's been talking about culture yeah. wars for very many years. Yeah, um, yeah, they don't get it. A lot of a lot of mainstream conservatives simply don't get it. Um, it's expressed well in that Michael Malice saying about you know conservatism is just progressivism driving at the speed limit. Yeah. All they're doing is trying to do it at a slower pace of um, erosion uh, of of these uh, of these um, moral foundations and and as you say it's I mean you know James will talk about it in terms of a spiritual war uh, you know these people being Luciferian but you can take these words and abstract them from that sense of the kind of esoteric you know transcendent transcendent um, and actually just you know clarify the meaning as being to do with you know the articulation of all the worst forms of of incentive and the worst forms of psychological and spiritual drives in people you know it's all a kind of it's a distillation of this sort of you know the sheer pus of the human spirit <laughs> in some way um and and that's what um you know we're struggling against that there's there are people who they they weaponize all of their antipathy for the society that has been built up heretofore 
and create a kind of complex sort of critical theory which they apply to that uh, and and they want to seek to expand that and to you know um, you know sort of thrust it right through all dimensions and all levels of society as a critique which ultimately ends with the breakup with the destruction of that society they're not they're wanting to reconfigure it in a in a pattern that is is not like what we would think of as as nice oldie england you know they they don't want that sort of continuity they don't want that tradition they don't want that stability they don't want that respect and proportion and you know a sense of uh, you know social uh, hierarchy and, and all of these kinds of things which we might think of as conservative values which kind of work well you know when they're when they're in a kind of a certain kind of uh, you know cosmology a certain kind of spiritual understanding and a certain kind of psychological and political understanding you know being in a nation you know uh, having having some uh, sense of who your people are having some sense of your connection with those people and with god you know if you are a believing uh, person you know I, I i don't happen to believe in god but i've latterly begun to realize that there is a god-shaped hole in my life there is something missing mm. and there is something uh, you know christopher hitchens used to talk about the numinous something that hits you when you know maybe you're transported by you know the consolations of philosophy or great works of art that you helps you connect with something something deeper and um i think that's the thing that's being challenged that's being that is literally being attacked and we do have to respond in like form um, to to counteract that, I don't think there's any doubt that, that you know, these these are, you know, again, try, you know, d just breaking it apart from individuals, like we were talking about with the issue of migration earlier. It's it's more that it's become a consensus amongst certain groups of people, large groups of people, certain interest groups, you know, certain institutions, organisations. It's become a kind of dogma um, yes. that is being propagated and and perpetrated at you in every dimension of your life and i think it's time to sort of try and uh, you know <clears throat> reclaim <laughs> to use lawrence's party mm -hmm. i guess as one word you know or to uh, or to you know um you know fight back against that and and say you know I, I don't think you have to accept all of this stuff i think the the notion that it's so overwhelming and it's just going to happen anyway i mean this is the thing that tony blair likes to say you know well these these technological changes you know it's the way things are heading that's bullshit yeah that's absolute bullshit well, it's that, not the way things head technology doesn't does doesn't just decide this it's it's instrumentalized by people who have certain incentives and they want it to go in a direction and they represent forces of power that you need to contend with and say actually no we don't want this well they have um back in the 90s um they the new labor obviously came in on a wave of people just being sick and tired of the tory sleaze and all the rest of it that yeah. was going on at the time surprise surprise back again now um but the nasty part as it was i mean the tories have been have been they've spent the last 20 or 30 years doing mm. two things the first one being trying to uh, not be the nasty party because of yeah. that dreadful speech that uh, Theresa may did um yeah. and yes they were perceived as the, the nasty party but because they at the time were largely seemed to be corrupt and uh, a lot of the people that they had as mps were basically alan bastard caricatures weren't they so i mean yeah. um had it been people like charles walker who I, i'm really mm. disappointed with in the recent past because he just sure, disappeared yeah. but at the beginning he mm. was exactly the sort of man that I wanted to be in Parliament. You know, mm. he was he was genuinely outraged by the way um, a protester yeah. who turned out, I think she was Extinction Rebellion or something, but this old lady that mm. was being treated. He went mm. into Parliament and he um, mm. raised it in Parliament. He was shaking with anger yeah. um, and yeah, very articulate as well. And he made his point. It was fantastic. And then he did another great speech about the lockdowns and how they weren't working. Mm. And then they've obviously got to him somehow because he's just disappeared off the face of the planet. But yeah. but if if we had politicians like him um, on yeah. both sides of the house, that would be great. But we don't have Tory politicians like that. We have, um, well, I'm not even going to mention them, but we all know who they are. They're just, you know, careerist, um, yeah. snivelling, oh, I'm sick of them. I really am sick of them. And the same in yeah. the Labour Party as well. You know, I mean, they're 12-year-old yeah. student politicians in the Labour Party. We've got a shadow foreign secretary who looks about 12 and speaks like she's about 13. I mean, you know, 
Good yeah. God, I'm, I'm sick of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it's, it's understandable that you, that you say, you know, these are the sorts of people. But again, I think it's only often very fleetingly that you see this, you know, Charles Walker or Desmond Swain, you know, they become a kind of flavor of the week for a time, you know, because um, they, you know, they, they, they maybe have a single thing that happens to them, like in Charles Walker's case, or yeah. a few things happen to them. And they, for a moment, they inhabit a dimension of kind of righteous indignation and outrage. And we all kind of go, yes, that's the sort of voice we want. And then the next week, they kind of completely blow it by yeah. sort of, you know, um, <laughs> propounding the vaccination uh, yeah. program. Uh, yeah. or, uh, the or, Prime Minister's doing a wonderful job. Or, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and you and just think... So, you know it's the sort of the jacob reese mogg story you know from 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 riches to uh well, i don't know what but yeah. you know politically rags in the sense that nobody kind of trusts them anymore so i think you've got to sort of actually perhaps divorce it from that sense of those personalities and actually look at the the notion of a politics that fulfills more of those dimensions of 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 moral um sanctity and propriety and you know um, righteous indignation um in in one person and in many people you know it's it's kind of something that you can't just i think leave the hope to certain charismatic people to emerge no. and embody all of the good things together because it seems very rare that they do um and they're know, always going to let you down on something and if you, you can't yeah. you can't i mean there's a lot of people talking about this at the moment and saying the problem is we've got this personality politics i totally get that of course that's because of the media that inhabits the the space of you know communication and everything it um you need to have parties. We need a third party, don't we, really? Um, and I don't know how that ever is going to happen in this, the way uh, political um, system works. Mm. We're, we're, we're losing the second party at the moment, so I don't really know yes. how we're going to get a third party in. I think there are ways. There are ways. There are things that have happened in Europe in, in various kinds of populist party that are giving a, an example of the way things perhaps need to go in order that we perhaps challenge the notion of the representative democracy that we have now. I think there's much more of an appetite for a, a, a direct democracy approach where, as you have in Switzerland, you have mm. referenda, which mean that what people decide is uh, put to a vote. It is then instantiated as law and politicians become more or less kind of like technicians to enact and to oversee the management of the express will of the people in that way. And I think kind of that needs to happen more because, to be honest, as we saw with Brexit, they can't be trusted to exercise the will of the people as it is given to them with the spirit and intention given to them they they try and kind of parse the issue they try and of try and subdivide it and say well what did the people mean when they said this you know and i think a lot of people are pretty clear about what things actually mean and and you know it's perhaps just a question of the the art of putting together referendums and questions of policy that may need to be trimmed and refined a little bit to make it even clearer but it seems there was a singular lack of will and sympathy with the issues that were being dealt with and the way that they for, I, I can't remember even how long it's, it just seems to have gone on forever now the shenanigans we had when we had the brexit vote and then getting that ratified and put through was such an odious farrago and such a disgusting spectacle where we saw the the kind of you know shenanigans and prevarications that were you know you know, it, we're brought in on you know specious legal and moral grounds, yeah. and and people gaming the the kind of decision making process to 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 horse trade whether it was for for extra money for Northern Ireland or you know whether it was for you know support on certain other issues. I think it was it was absolutely foul, and I think that has to stop, and I think it has to be taken out of those those hands and put into the hands of. Um, an approach or, or a system or as I say a reconfiguration of the democratic process that means that those things are no longer negotiable with the individual persons of politicians and parties and that uh, they have to be uh, respected fully and and like justice is meant to be enacted you know impartially and promptly uh, and uh, and you know this has to this has to be changed um, so I think there's there's got to be a pressure uh, towards you know, incentivizing politicians towards that that's going to come from perhaps other other forms of political uh, representation that will happen within the current system in the future, but articulating the the kinds of means and motives that um, that I've talked about there. You know, um, we can't give up. Yeah, well, no, we can't. I, mean, I, I do think I mean, what you're just saying there. I mean, I, I feel at the moment certainly we've gone the other way in terms of I don't for the first time 
Um, I suppose when I saw the, the the whole Tommy Robinson thing, whenever that was, three years ago or something, um, it, it, when he got banged up in an afternoon for um, yes. reporting on the steps of a, you know, whether or not it was, well, as it turns out, it wasn't a, um, he, the, the appeal courts found that he wasn't in contempt, but he, he, mm. then, yeah. I don't know, on the technical issues and what have you, but... At the mm. end of the day, what you, whatever you think of him, um, the fact was I lost. I, I suddenly realised that we lived in a very different country when uh, yes. a judge looking out of a window can point down and say, I don't like yeah. that guy. I yes. don't even know what he said because I'm not even going to listen to what he said in court, but I'm going to send him down and he's going to get a prison for six months for contempt yes. um, this afternoon. And it was just, yes. I mean, outstanding. And then to win it at appeal, which was which was encouraging that he, he, mm. he got out on appeal. But then, mm. of course, the state decided they are going to get him. So they just go back in and get So I don't have yeah. any any faith i'm afraid in the legal system in this country anymore um i yeah. think the political the police is, the police are hugely politicized now um which worries me a great deal because i think that's a really dangerous the media are um are, are beyond the pale um mm. so i i think i i'm afraid i'm i'm rather um i yeah. say i'm blackpilled but i'm certainly not yeah. very optimistic but what yeah. I, I do think that what you're saying and what we need to do is very clear, and I and I also get the feeling that more and more people are coming on board as well, which is encouraging. Yes. And yes, what you said very, about uh, Tony good. Blair, uh, I'm yeah. saying, you know, th what they do very well, um, mm. this sort of common purpose um, globalist kind yeah. of operation. They're very slick. They take it very mm. seriously. They play the long game, and mm. they are ruthless. And they are very good because they've now got all the levers of power. Yeah. At um, yes, convincing. They win on lethargy, don't they? They win on the fact that yes. people are lethargic and, oh, well, yes, it's time that Labour got That's in. That's it. Now, they're losing that now because I don't see the Labour Party getting in any time soon. And I think mm. perhaps from what you said and, and the mm. fact that people are starting to be converted from this two-party thing, perhaps people are going to start looking at that. Perhaps they see small podcasts, larger podcasts like... Um, um, Lotus Eaters or Sargon of a Cad and Secretary mm. of a Cad and Lotus Eaters. Obviously, yeah. that's that's not really a podcast anymore. That's a almost a station in its own right, isn't it? I yeah. mean, it's um, yeah. it's it's really almost up there with GBTV. I would say in some ways better. Yeah. Um, so you've got people like that. You've got the, the Michael Malices of this world to go global, yeah. and you've got all the normal podcasts. You've got Irreverent, who I think are great. Um, yes, you probably know yes, Irreverent. Yeah. Um, and um, so there's a lot of podcasts that are coming out that are much bigger than my humble little thing. But I mean, um, so I think, yes, it all works. I think it all helps and it's exploring ideas and it's showing people oh, yeah. as a way out of if, where we are at the moment. Totally. You're just as much an important part of it as, as me or anybody else in just that you're making some sort of contribution towards that. And uh, I think that is part of what it is. It's articulating what we're talking about which are really kind of populist sentiments you know they're sort of not to do with specific ideological kind of uh, directions you know mm. there's there's as you say there's sargon the kind of classical liberals more more or less kind of in the center really um there's people like me who are sort of quite you know reactionary and right wing um and there's going to be people on the left who are even going to express um populist agendas mm. and a lot of this kind of does need to start converging with a real appreciation and a, and a cons well a consensus if you like like, um, on the nature of the country as you've described it that that power you know is there and it's 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 exercised outside of the kind of scaffolding of the system that you thought was there power just acts the way it wants it can it can use that scaffolding to kind of justify its appearance and sort of you know um you know somewhat tart itself up but ultimately it just acts the way it wants to act you know the judicial process the parliamentary process the process of regulation uh it's uh it's it's superseded by the will to power that comes out of certain organizations certain agendas certain incentives certain people uh you know these things like you know i mean tony blair is is a man of considerable power in himself but he is acting in concert with other kinds of institutions and organizations and powers that that are expressed in in a number of different ways but they have a very clear direction you know they have a very strong sense of where they want this to go and in order to resist it we do have to organize in the way they do 
in real life. I mean, there's this thing that was on last weekend, um, GovCamp, which I tweeted about, where you had a kind of jamboree for left-wing civil servants to come together and to start workshopping how they implement policy. Now, this is policy that's given down to them by by government ministers who are, you know, MPs voted in by us. But then these guys in the civil service who are, you know, if you like, inflected towards the left, mm -hmm. um, work out how they can implement policy in the way that most suits their particular interest. And and this is a problem because that's exactly the way that things like common purpose work. They all yeah. they all get together in plain sight to a certain extent, and and have these meetings and discussion groups, and they form their networks. Um, it was interesting in that particular case that actually they did have some online content that they shut down once journalists started looking into it because they're completely untransparent and they're completely unaccountable because they're they're not doing this in official capacities, but they are doing this in the informal networking milieu yeah. of Whitehall to create changes in the way that things happen so you can you know you can take anything that's handed down by a minister and and you can send it in a particular direction you can mold it and shape it so it suits your agenda more than it does the spirit and intention of the the people passing the legislation and and this is a great danger and this is how as i say these things like common purpose work it's by this creation of 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 a consensus engine you know this manufacturing of consent that is done by ostensibly taking your decision and dressing it up the way they want to and unfortunately the way they're dressing it up is like uh, drag you know it's, it's turning it into drag queen story hour yeah. you know it's yeah. not uh, it's not just turning it into straight down the line you know government policy it's it's always putting a hand on the scales and i think that's something people have to be aware of that's how power operates these guys get into a gang and they do this stuff they don't ask you they're not interested in your mm -hmm. opinion mm -hmm. they just want to do what they want to do and luckily they're in positions that you pay for from from their point of view to be able to get together and go on these junkets and sort these things out you know as as, as they say in the musical hamilton in the room where it happens and uh, you know you're not invited well, and that's the, the problem the problem as well is that, and i'm sure i mean i don't know all 650 mps in fact i know fewer mps and members of the government now than ever in my life because i just really am not particularly interested in them but yeah. um um the quality of MPs now is mm. desperate. I mean, you know, I, I thought it, it, and they're all in the same, most of them are on the same gang. I mean, you've got a few that can't stand each other yeah. um, on either side of the house. But the majority, I noticed the other day, Stella Creasy yesterday had a baby. And right. um, I just happened to see it on Twitter. And there was like probably a dozen Tory MPs, all oh, congratulations, Stella, you know, the blah, blah. Well, fair enough, you know, we're all human, I suppose. And, but, um, I just don't see, from what I've seen of Stella Creasy and and um, and her ilk. Um, okay, mm. fine. You know, you might privately do it, but they're all on Twitter congratulating her and oh, congratulations, Stella, and blah 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 blah. Um, mm. Yeah, pers as a personal thing, you might say it's important that you retain that in politics, but mm. to broadcast it on Twitter to me, it just said, you know yeah. what, you're just all in the same group. You're all the same gang. You all you're all are just um, of the same. Yes. Basic, you know, you you're all going to cover each other's backs. That's what it said to me. Um, yes. I I know that you know there could be an argument for well, this is what's wrong with politics is that we're very tribal. But yes. sometimes when you've got such important things happening like we've got at the moment, I think you need to have yeah. a little bit of distance from people. Surely, I mean, it, um, mm. I mean. Mm. You know, but, I don't but know. it isn't there. It isn't there in that system. That's the thing. I was listening to an interesting um, uh, talk by a chap who calls himself the Woodlander. Uh, who um, he he's a bloke who lives off grid in the, in a forest up north somewhere. Right. He's built his own home. And interesting chap. He was interviewed, uh, you know, on Morgoth's uh, Morg cast right. uh, thing a few months ago. And he was talking the other day about how he used to be involved in politics in the Conservative Party, you know, eventually uh, at one time, you know, a number of years ago. And, you know, he went and saw how Westminster worked. You know, he he, he was, you know, um, uh, you know, hobnobbing with with MPs and, and you know, you know, quite senior people. He had dinner with Thatcher a couple of times, mm -hmm. you know, all sorts of engagements with people high up in the conservative party and he saw how westminster worked and he he was talking about how shocked he was at when he got there realizing that they are as michael lisley uses this phrase the uni party yeah. they are all one party yeah you know they all you know they all work together they all eat together drink together go on holidays together you know uh have relationships together um and it's across 
across the aisle you yeah. know this is not that they stick to their own territory it's it's all completely promiscuous and all intermingled and and cynically driven towards a negotiation behind the you know, the closed doors of whitehall to say well you know how do we do this how do we get this through what do we make of this and and most often and more often than not they are concerned with a certain kind of agenda that you know they can they wrangle over it somewhat left and right but at the same time they they're more or less in agreement with what what they want to happen yeah. and this is this is quite dispiriting to discover when you approach it close up but i've i've heard this not just from him but from other people as well, well I, that, I have uh, yeah my brother yeah. um a, a friend of his from sixth form um became a um what do you call it when you, you work for an MP? A sort of SPAD, a, special advisor? Yeah, that sort a, of a thing. Researcher? Um, a researcher, I think. It was before yeah. SPADs. It was just before SPADs, I think, about that time. Yeah. So the name is just a different name, isn't it? So um, mm. anyway, he worked for this local MP for a few years. And some mm. of the stories that... I mean, he was... It was a Labour MP, and he was quite... He obviously wanted to go and work for this Labour MP. Um, but some of the stories he came back with, he was similar. He was similarly sort of... Um, he, he left in the end and he wasn't really particularly um, impressed with the whole thing um, and yeah I think th th this is the problem they, you've got they're, they're low caliber I don't think they really a lot of them don't have any um, basic moral or ethical um, sort of yeah. I'm not saying they're all immoral, but they just, uh, as you say, they treat it like a job. It's not. Uh, it there are all sorts be. of incentives that are venal and that yeah, are convenient. You exactly, know. and and yes, it's, it's all about with... ego, and it's all about yeah. Um, yeah. I, sure. I just get the impression. That, I mean, there are one or two people out there that I'm sure do it, uh, try to do a good job, and of course they don't get on a lot of the time for that reason because they're not mm. prepared to bend the knee and everything, mm. um, and that's that's a problem isn't it but but i i think um you look at the way that um well, i can't i'm not even going to name them by name but everybody on the front bench of both parties um they're all non-entities really i don't think there's mm. any of them have, have got anything about them i think most yeah. of us could argue them um across the floor and back I, I, um and i'm not saying i'm a great sort of um advocate or, or you know somebody that can i'm, I'm not a bad per, i can argue a reasonable case i suppose given yeah. but it's never as easy as it looks when you're on tv for example and you're doing all that sort of stuff i understand that but yeah. i think if you were to sit in a room with them and have a conversation most of them haven't got a clue what's going on they don't know yeah. what's happening they're totally divorced from it all they spend their time in westminster or on um my local mp spends most of her time on various foreign affairs committees, on jaunts off to here, there, and everywhere, um, mm. and she's constantly posting on Twitter. The only thing she ever posts on Twitter is, um, is you know, we've d um, delighted that the Ethiopian uh, lesbian something or other is now. I mean, she's a Tory MP, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. has now been funded, and that we're hoping to get fourteen Ethiopian lesbians into uh, Oxbridge over the next five years. You know, and yeah. and it's just like. Oh, it's everything that seems conspicuously alien to people's ordinary concerns. Exactly. You know, it's, it's the, 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 the elevation of the exotic into a kind of, um, you know, uh, a marker of ordinariness to say, you know, this is how things should be. We should be kind of concerned about the minutiae of extreme niche interest groups in <laughs> this way, instead of thinking about how we actually, you know, hold a whole society together. You know, it's not a Unitarian kind of thing it's uh you know it's the particularist and the uh you know the exotic uh yes. kind of uh intellect that's that's interested in this stuff because it actually is a great cope for having to deal with those exactly. boring problems of how things are going in so know, much Mrs. easier Jones, isn't it? there's no consequences totally. whether you fail yeah. or not is never noticed um and it's not like we've got you know a, a national health service which is pretty much destroyed now i don't i don't know how it's ever going to come back um we've got um huge financial problems which again i don't know how we come back from those you know globally but i mean that's a mm. massive problem mm. we've got mm. Um, the now ongoing problems of things like the Afghanistan fallout, we've yeah. got Hong Kong, we've got um, housing problems, we've got a, an entire generation who are going to be disenfranchised from um, from a large yes. part of their life yes. because they they can't necessarily have children or they've got no stability because they can't buy a house, they can't participate in wealth creation. Um, uh, you've got the racial and the cultural frictions, which yes. are only going to get worse. You've got um, population, demographic yes time bombs yes. happening yes you've got yes. all of that happening and then you've got these pointless mps 
doing their mm-hmm. ridiculous vanity projects. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. It, it's the very... job, yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's a profound dislocation, a profound dis- disconnect between us and the apparent centers of power but of course these are not really the centers of power these are you know as as near reactionaries say these are part of the show these yeah. are part of the distraction this is the 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 performative engagement of um you know elements uh within that uh locus of power uh to give the appearance of a negotiation of terms but there is no there is no negotiation the consensus has been arrived at it's manufactured through the systems of of academia and government and business and media feeding back all into the same process that that isn't permeable to the concerns of the populace as such it's it's a project that's derived of uh you know what we would consider perhaps esoteric and outlandish uh, critical theories of how to approach society and nothing to do with the things which have traditionally defined societies like tradition you know like history like social continuity you know like uh, economic uh, you know stable stability yep. you know it's 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 abstracted from that and it's it's a complete performance and and the you know the the the, the way you say is how do we deal with all these problems they're all coming down the pike uh we're, we're yet to see it, it it looks like it could be a bit of an almighty clusterfuck um and it could be a reason for why we're we're seeing this this will towards a, a shaking up of the pieces and and a reformatting of the system and yeah some sort of great well, reset perhaps so. that's a very good phrase you've invented there it's, it's like somebody should take that up and write a book about it and have a website on it oh no i'm sorry i forgot they already have done oh, i wish somebody uh, would tell toby young that that's what i'm going to say yeah that's well if good. only if only somebody would tell toby a few things have you have you know, listened to london calling recently have you noticed i did how, listen to this week's one yes i listened religiously actually yeah. i got i got a real sense of it kind of you know the the distance growing there because because I think Toby is is kind of a he's a he's a nice chap and he's a man who invests in arguments with good faith, but it seems increasingly a stark separation between the sort of the vision of life continuing in a sort of hunky dory motherhood and apple pie fashion along yeah. one timeline, and the the contrast with the timeline of people who are, you know, as as as, as is being said now, you know, awake, let's say, uh, to the um, the the very uh, heavy uh, set of narratives that uh, are coming through simply looking at the the facts on the ground and trying to yeah. you know connect up the pieces and 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 explain the mechanisms whereas he's he's kind of just he's concerned with the forms of the old you know the patterns of life that are kind of you know they they, they were seeming the way, I mean he was talking about going to the cinema you know and, and yeah. what a lovely experience that was and of course yes it probably does by contrast seem a lovely experience in some ways but it also struck me as seeming like a very anesthetized kind of um view as a sense in which it was shutting out you know the, the reality of the world and engaging in a bit of kind of you know fatic entertainment yeah. you know it, it doesn't well, really I, mean anything but it he, feels good that conversation was interesting because yeah, i got the same impression i mean i do get the impression though that um they've obviously known each other a long time sure they, 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 there is a good dynamic between them um yeah i get the impression from i mean i've had a couple of i don't know james but i have emailed oh. him and and vice versa sure. and yeah I've been on the wrong side of um, a sharp tongue a couple of times <laughs> on Twitter or something. I, but it's know. not personal with him. No, it's no, not I, I'm, I'm not. I don't take it personally. But I do no. know. I, I see where James and Toby are very different people, and I think um, mm. Toby is. You can see that in the way they talk, but in that Toby kind of. I think there is. I mean, they're open about it. James says, you know, well, I haven't got any friends left now, so um, you know. And I mean, I know he's, you know. He, kind of joking but he was yeah. part of the in crowd if you like or on you know sure and 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 he has been kind of ostracized to a large extent so um mm. so i which i think is very admirable but so mm. i think toby probably is a little bit concerned that he has done that and he obviously wants to keep himself slightly distanced yes. from being painted with that same brush yeah. even yeah. though he is being anyway i think that's the problem he's he's mm. trying to be that really reasonable it, it's a yes. bit. It's a bit like to use uh, people we've just been talking about. Um, um, the um, Charles Walker, yes. who we were just talking about. This very sort of civilized yeah. seems to be on the face of it, very reasonable, civilized, 
moral kind of guy. That's how he comes across to me. It's a bit yeah. like having him in um, a, a fight to the death with <laughs> Alexi Sale or something, yeah. you know. And yeah, that's yeah, kind yeah. of how I see it with with, um, with with Toby. I mean, he does lots of... He works really hard. He does loads and loads of stuff, which is worthwhile. Yeah, and he yeah, does yeah. make one very good point, which is that, James, it's all right calling everybody, you know, um, the cabal or whatever, but yeah, you've yeah. got to change people's minds, and I do. Yeah. I get that, yes. but I'm I'm kind of on. I'm I'm more of James kind of person on that sort of thing. Yeah. I just yeah uh, yeah. yeah. I, I can see a good faith in operation, and I can see an investment in doing things by slow, careful, fastidious, somewhat plodding progress towards improvement you know and he's done that by his work with setting up the free speech union yep. and lockdown skeptics and all of that and creating a sort of you know a, a, a an aggregation of interest around those things which you know he's got a lot of followers he's got about one hundred and fifty thousand followers i think and, and james is about sort of just coming up to about eighty thousand, i think so he's got sort of a, a greater reach in numerical terms and mm. he's he's got a recognition factor and as you say he's seen to be a kind of more palatable um you know figure from the conservative right um um, but at the same time there's always a feeling that he's kind of conceding a bit naively to forces which aren't prepared to play by the kind of genteel rules which he seems to embody i don't think he's completely naive about those things i think he's aware at some level but i think he does try to take the view of well i'm going to try and work within the system as it is and and preserve some of these goods which are built up through diligent and continuous progress uh, you know, by by forming organisations and unions and things like that. And you know, I think his father founded the Open University. You know, so very oh, right. very laudable. And it's a, it's a kind of an intellectual tradition of you know we're doing it in a, in a slow and steady, restrained English way. And I think perhaps the feeling with the rest of us and people like James is perhaps that just time is running out for yeah. that. I think there's, I, that's yeah, got very a time well limit. I think yeah. that's 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 kind of where I'm I'm losing patience, but I am also conscious that I am very much on the James side of things. I tend to, I'm I've noticed as I most of my friends would say that I'm a relatively calm, slow to anger kind of. Um, You're a nice chap, reasonable person. But You're a nice chap. <laughs> thank you. But um, yeah. but I am actually um, mm-hmm. very uh, emotional, and yeah. and and and, yeah. and I do. Um, if I lose it, then I I have lost it. You know, I'm, 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 sure. I I don't mean I go around sort of you know tearing people's heads off, but um, yeah. um, so I am driven by um, a, a emotion to some extent. Whereas yes. I've got friends of mine who are very much like maybe like Toby. They're very cool. They can yeah. argue and keep calm. I just I get to a point where I just if it's important where I I I, I am of the you know I just want to tell people what I think. But um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's interesting. I think perhaps there's a, the space of both of them, and he might be right. Perhaps he's right in the, in his tactics, in that he is maintaining a voice on the edge yeah. of um, where we might be, um, mm-hmm. and is able to convert more people that way. So perhaps he is right in that. Um, but I think yeah. there's also, yeah, I think I think you're right when you say that he's sort of of the genteel, a bit like. Yeah. First World War general, you know, who earned his earned his stripes um, yes. uh, out in North Africa fighting the, yes. you know, what they call them, the fuzzy wuzzies or something at the time. I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm quoting. I'm quoting. And we've um, had the first racist moment yeah. of the show, which is uh, I am quoting a, a 1970s TV program. Of course um, you are. Yes. And um, but you know whatever. So you've got that sort of thing, and they're from a different era, and then they come in. Yeah. Um, and then you've got a mechanized war where, um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I wonder whether it could be either, couldn't it? Really, could be either. Well, you wonder. I mean, yeah, there's part of you that sometimes likes to think, you know, well, maybe both of them will help us get there. You know, James with his kind of, you know, fire-breathing zeal and energy, and Toby with his kind of ponderous, <laughs> decent, um, diligent approach to things. And perhaps it'll be a synthesis of the two. I just fear, though, that I think it's not so much that. It's that Toby kind of is is aware of the system that we're in and wants to, you know, retain and prosper and conserve in the system within his small patch, you know, whether it's his family and his loved ones and his friends. Yeah. And it's it's not a sense of, you know, perhaps wider duty to a, a nation or a society that, that you know, has, has a, 
you know, a bigger scope to it than that. And I think James is someone who who's working on big picture principle. Yes. And, you know, the difficulty for many people, of course, is, as you say, they're friends, you know, and I, I don't think it's anyone's kind of prerogative to go and try and break up a friendship and alienate them from each other. People saying, oh, James, you need to ditch Toby and Toby's guys saying you need to ditch James. I don't think that's kind of stupid. I mean, there's going to be some some people in your life who you can be friends with who you may have these disagreements with, but you are still going to be friends. I've got yeah. a friend who's a so classic old labor guy and uh, you know, we're still friends and stuff, but yeah. you know, we, we, we won't agree on the, the how you run a country. Um, um, although o- over time you do, you t- tend to get closer with Asian experience. So it's, it's something that, you know, I think, um, you know, we'll just have to kind of, uh, you know, see what happens. And, and I, I think, I think my money's on, on the the thing that you know well toby may you know do well for himself you know get his peerage or whatever he it definitely is wants a gong you can tell he sure. wants a gong yeah 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 and which is fair enough be... if that's what you want that's okay yeah yeah uh, and he may be able to live with that and i guess it's just a question of whether that means at some point he has to kind of stick with a system and we have to diverge and go our own way but um i just i just don't know uh i think it's 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 something for you know those those people to negotiate in their own way and uh you know come to whatever accommodation they they do with their god so to speak exactly um, but i mean either way that the the, the I, I enjoy the podcast and the way that mm. they, their dynamic is very good um and um yeah I, I they get a lot done in a in like 45 minutes which we're, we are now at two hours 49 minutes so i am definitely oh. going to uh i think <laughs> it would be a good idea whilst we've got i've got lots of other stuff we could talk about i think we ought to bring it to a close um and we haven't even done my traumatic childhood. Isn't that good? <laughs> <laughs> well, you you glossed over that. You see, we did. Yeah, we, we, I did ask you to start at the beginning, and then you. Um, yeah, well, I skipped we'll have it. To, yeah. We'll, what we'll have to do is we'll have to do another one in say six months' time. Yeah, see and, if there's popular demand to know about uh, my my uh, deeply buried misery. <laughs> Well, definitely. We can, I, I'm not going to go into it now at two hours fifty, but it, now you've left us with something for people to. Um, I, I am yeah. now intrigued. Um, yeah. But I, I think, um, in terms of um, where what you're mm. doing now, then with D- difficult second album, this yeah. I, I think probably this won't go out because are you doing something tomorrow? Thursday. Um, hopefully on Friday uh, we'll be uh, having a show. I hope to have Michael Livesley on the show. And I'm I'm trying to apply subtle pressure to his colleague on the Nice Things podcast, Paul Carmichael, to come on as well to have a cosy chat about the world of acting and performance. And um, I'm I think um, the thing is they've got proper jobs, unlike me. <laughs> I'm self-employed. I work the hours I want to work. But um, um, I, it would be nice to have them both in the studio and and do a bit of a because we're all Gen X, aren't we? Here, you know, we we want to do a bit of a, a, a nostalgist warm bath of uh, reminiscences and and uh, discussions about our acting performance and and TV and things like that. So, could could be a goodie. That could be or very it could good. Could all go tits up. Like, <laughs> well, the nice things. I, I think they've got a good thing going with nice things. I think it's got a really nice vibe to it. Um, yeah, works really well. Even if you if, even if you don't know the autistic levels of detail that they know about stuff, which is really mm. impressive, um, it has just got a good sort of you learn things about them even though you might not understand everything they're talking about or know all the history you learn things about them as people and about their sensibilities and sentiments and their view of the world and i think it's 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 actually really good it's really 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 engaging and i like it for because I'm, I'm interested in similar sorts of things but i think there's something that's, that's simmering nicely there and will grow into a really nice broadcast relationship if, if it keeps going i think so and i mean they're both charismatic people and they've got a great way about them um i get the impression because um um uh i follow paul and he follows me on twitter that we probably differ politically um but um <laughs> it's it's quite nice that that's the case if you know, he seems a yeah, fairly decent maybe guy. maybe i i think he could be a bit of a dark horse actually i think uh, there's there's you know there's the man on twitter and there's the inner man you know it's uh, <laughs> Just saying, just saying. I'm okay. not hinting anything here that's being uh, concealed. Uh, but um, <laughs> I think there is, and I, 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 you know, I think it's also, if we're wrapping up, it's a good point to commend you as well. I really enjoyed your your talk with London Raider. I thought it was a fantastic journey through two really interesting lives, um, which was was well meshed by London Raider's trick of getting you to talk about yourself. He was very well. good, wasn't he? Very good, very and, sly, and, and we- very. We both rambled off and, different, and kept getting lost as well, but it all seemed to come back eventually, which was um, 
which was good. Not all editing. Some of that just happened organically. But Oh, um, it was beautiful. I really liked it. It was like, an, and he was very nice and complimentary about me, and I thank, I thank him for that because it was very fan. flattering. No, he's a big fan. I, well, we both are. I got the sense. I got the sense you two could be, uh, you know, a little bit of a friendship item at some point. You know, I well, think, I think we we both decided, although we've got slightly different. You're both quite adventurous. Well, yeah, and we've got quite different backgrounds, childhood backgrounds and stuff. Although we both went to boarding school, but um, yeah, um, right. we had different backgrounds. And obviously, he um, largely was brought up by um, a single mother and all the rest of it, which you would have heard yeah. in the in the podcast. But a lot of what. It was a, a lot of our, our career had similar things. You know, our careers yeah. followed similar paths, and um, we both um, we're both currently single of an age. I'm, yes. I'm you know, a bit older than him, but he's we about the same are. age as you, I think. Actually, yeah, we all we are all we're all yeah, sort of failed, hopeless middle aged <laughs> men. Um, you <laughs> know, but, nothing uh, better to do than go on YouTube and chat to each other. So, well, but, you uh, just got you just got to smile, or you're going to cry, and oh, that's indeed. what I thought was great. There was there was so much laughter in there, and there was also some stuff that I found genuinely moving and quite shocking and and uh and poignant mm. and i thought that was that was why i thought it was a great podcast i thought it was it's one of the best podcasts i've heard full stop in that sense because i thought oh. it was a great journey two very adventurous guys being quite brave with their life and not afraid to admit setbacks and to discuss things at a very personal level but also at a in a spirit of optimism hope and humor yeah. and i thought that was exceptional i thought you'd really kind of found your sort of you know your kind of metier there your speed and uh, I, I'm probably going to be, by comparison, a bit a bit more restrained in the way I come across. But uh, as I say, I haven't given you the uh, the uh, the abysms of darkness. Well, which, we'll, uh, we'll my look forward habits. to listening to. You see the what I did there? Show. I set I set up myself for another one of these. You, you did, see. and I'd be more than happy to have you back on again. If you, I know you're very busy at the moment with these. You're doing a lot of. No, them. I know. I'm a shameless tart. I will uh, haul <laughs> yeah, we, myself out to any podcast that wants me. Well, the other thing, Simon, that you have to, which you probably could tell by the end of that podcast. Mm. Was that we both started drinking almost at the beginning, yep. and five hours later we were still talking, I didn't notice. still drinking. I didn't uh, notice at all. I, the, the, seriously, the, the if any drunkenness there be, there were was, um, it wasn't noticeable at all because you you it was like being with old friends sitting by the fire with a whiskey yes. and just chatting about life. And I thought that was a great uh, great terrific. I say just a journey through so many different you know moods and events and environ. You know, you know, people, you know, people being vomited on, and you know, <laughs> golf carts and Uma Thurma, and you uh, know, and, and, uh, yeah, and, and all that. I mean, yeah, and I mean, there was, there was some stuff there that we had to leave on the cutting room floor from both of us, and um, uh, London Raider as well did some had some very interesting things to say, which I had to cut out both for time and, uh, as I say, also because litigious um, reasons. I can't <laughs> afford the lawyers, so um, some of it had to be cut out. But uh, perhaps yeah. if you meet him in September at the third Wednesday, he will be able to fill you in on those yeah. particular stories. So um, oh, okay. Simon, Simon Roberts, who is uh, currently the uh, host of the D Difficult Second Album, which is a YouTube channel. Um, he is uh, well known amongst those that know. Um, I uh, was going to introduce him and then completely forgot by calling him the guy behind the guy, um, <laughs> which I think is actually quite a good summary of ha of what I know of Simon. Um, mm. But Simon, you, I think, probably know that you're much loved amongst the community which is growing on this side of the political sphere. Um, thank you very much for joining me and for your uh, encouragement um, and chiving me along when I was saying, oh, you know, I'm not sure I could be asked to do another one and you sort of got me to do it. And uh, it's much appreciated. I know you do it for other people as well. And I'm sure they feel the same. So um, this is the point where we say for now, until the second second phase where we talk about other things in your life, perhaps with a, a gin and tonic or a whiskey in hand, mm. we say uh, Simon Roberts, Thank you very much for joining. And um, if you haven't yet visited the Difficult Second Album, look up on YouTube. Follow Simon at Simon underscore Roberts on Twitter. And uh, you won't be disappointed with the output on either. Sam, it's been an exceptional pleasure. And uh, it only remains to say, uh, is it au revoir or is it goodbye? It'll be an au revoir. It's goodbye. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Okay. Thanks, Simon. And uh, speak to you again soon. Take care.